Good evening and welcome to the College of Complexes. My name is Tim and will be moderated tonight by uh, Brown. No, I know it's not. But I'd like to welcome all of you again and uh, just to briefly explain the format of our college, we start off with our our speaker who will speak for a little bit. Okay, we start off with announcements first, but this is three parts. Speak a little bit. The speaker speaks, then we have a question and answer period, then we have a rebuttal period. And let's give a big hand for tonight's moderator, Brown. Take it away, Brown. Well, we heard the rules, Brown. We heard the rules. We heard the rules. He's not that bothered. All right. Without further ado, then, we will hear from uh, who is, by the way, the, uh, the director of the Northwest Information Service? All right. Uh, frequently, a speaker here. I'm the, you know, the director of what's called the Northwest Information Service in Palatine. It's a small organization. My brother and I, a couple other people, we just collect, read books, translate them into one-page cliff notes, and we work with large databases. We don't work with one book or the opinion of any one author. Uh, it's like the difference between there. There's a debate going on whether the Earth is flat or round. The uh, Flat Earth Society in England has about 2,000 members. But the round earth data is 99.9% .9 certain now. And on, uh, so uh, we take the round earth side on any issue where the database is so big and so massive that it's pretty much scientifically unassailable, very solid. None of the book reports we have published in the last seven years have been disproven or challenged in any way. They've all gone on to become accepted uh, by general public knowledge because we're working with knowledge like from Galileo's time where <laughs> Galileo published the truth but it took the church 350 years to issue an apology. Uh, science moves forward. Knowledge moves forward in the direction of truth. And um, in America, it's very difficult to know what's happening and what's real and what isn't because of our mainstream media. They run coordinated blackouts on certain kinds of issues while they're simultaneously promoting a myth. So uh, tonight's talk is about the ancient uh, Mayan prophecies. Uh, here's one book called The Mysteries of 2012, another one called 2012 Awakening. Uh, the one that I got the most notes out of, uh, my favorite, is called oops, the 2000, the 2012 story, The Myths, Fallacies, and Truth Behind the Most Intriguing Date in History. Uh, this is John Major Jenkins, is the author of this book, okay? And um, Basically, uh, the ancient Mayan calendar, uh, the long count calendar, is a 26,000 year long cycle that's based on uh, the movement of the sun and the stars and how our, excuse me. Can I sit there? Yes, I saw it also. I'm late, I'm sorry. Pick a seat anywhere. Um, a lot of people, as I said, hold on. There's been a lot of confusion on uh, the 2012 story. We did a, a book report, a simple one pager. This blue handout, you can take it with you. There's a stack of them up here. Uh, a lot of people have confused the Mayan prophecies with uh, some of the other religious prophecies around the world like Nostradamus or uh, some Christian sects talking about uh, Armageddon approaching in the end of the world and uh, you know get saved and be ready to go to heaven. Um, a lot of religions got it wrong. Uh, they, they predicted end time dates and those dates have come to pass and the planet and humanity is still here. The Mayan philosophy is that uh, humanity 
evolves, uh, I mean, culture gets better. Uh, it just goes through changes, long cycles of time. And uh, the, the date, 2012, uh, December 21st this year, it happens on uh, the winter solstice, uh, when the sun is at the lowest Party. point. Kind of uh, it's like a, a rebirth. Uh, that long cycle uh, is based on the movement of the sun and the stars, uh, how our, our Earth um, and the, the planetary alignments, how they, they align up pointing to the center of the galaxy once every 26,000 years. So the Mayans got the time frame right, the movement of the sun and the stars, the planets, long before anybody had telescopes on Earth. You know, nobody knows how they did it, but modern astronomers uh, looking out into space with the Hubble telescope and everything else, for the last 50 years they've been confirming uh, the galactic calendar that the Mayans left us. <clears throat> and uh, they, 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 the part of their story is that uh, humanity moves forward uh, over, you know, the ages. You pass through ages. Uh, this December 21st, the, the astrology, uh, the age of Pisces ends and the age of Aquarius begins. And they said uh, that date, the age of Aquarius will be marked by uh, more enlightenment. Um, how did they put it? Uh, Okay, I won't tell her. I'll take a look here. Um, yeah, the, the age of Pisces ends. Uh, that's you know egocentric behavior, guru worship, uh, you know unaccountability for one's actions. These are all things that are common. Uh, you know, ego and hubris. These are all common uh, to the dying Pisces age, where. Uh, starting the new age, there would be an increased awareness, self-responsibility, community cooperation, enhanced social consciousness. Um, basically, uh, the Christians call this the war between good and evil, you know, God and the devil. Uh, the Mayans call it a war between the forces of light and the forces of darkness, a, a contest getting more and more specific and energetic in the last four years leading up to the end of that cycle and the beginning of a new one. And um, what caught my eye was um, in the in the Mayan prophecies, uh, the forces of light are symbolized by a, a couple of beings called the hero twins. And uh, the forces of darkness are, are symbolized by a character called Seven Macau. Seven Macau is kind of like the agent of the devil. It's pictured as this big bird that makes a huge screeching noise and, uh, and promotes, you know, uh, ego above everything else. Uh, lack of empathy. Um, pretty much what we saw in the uh, episodes with Enron, where they just said, uh, we don't care how many people die, we're going to make a bundle of money, you know, shorting out electricity in California. Um, okay. The, um, okay. the the thing that caught my eye about the prophecies also was that they claim that you see a, the last four, five, six years leading up to the change of a cycle, there's a quickening of events happening around the world. More and more good things are happening, uh, being fulfilled, uh, done by the agents of light, and you see more and more activity. More and more activity by the agents of darkness. What, what's happening, Frank? Please, please, Just turn that off. Okay, well, we got a little. In any, in any case, um, turn, hold on. Put a little lower. Got to get the feedback just right so it's not uh, screeching. Can everybody hear me back there now? Can everybody hear okay? Yeah. Okay. Um, basically, uh, what what I'd like to talk about is the uh, the different the different pathways. You know, the the war between light and darkness leading up to the junction of December 21st 
and uh, what it means for humanity, human race. Um, they, sensors in one of these books. And that's, uh, the government's spying on you, Andy. That's <laughs> wrong. Yeah. But, uh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like Does that dark. other microphone work on this? No, that's the best one. This, this is the best one? Yes. Let's try it but this I think it's your watch when it was close to the post. Uh, <coughs> the Mayans uh, don't, as I said, they don't talk about the end of the world. They're talking about a change in um, direction, human consciousness. They, uh, throughout their teachings, like many others, they say we have free will. We get to choose which pathway the human race is going to go. On. If they call that one book, uh, you know, calls it an awakening. If enough people wake up and move in a positive direction in time, we can avoid an avert uh, planetary disaster. If enough of us continue to stay asleep and continue to allow the agents of Seven Macau to promote planetary, global, environmental destruction at all levels, then we go over the cliff and head toward uh, global destruction. Uh, on the way down here tonight, uh, a man uh, from NASA, Bill McKibben, was talking about the work of James Hansen, the climate scientist, and others, hundreds of climate scientists around the world have said if the global planetary, global warming environment, if it warms up another degree, we've already warmed up a degree, if it warms up two degrees, we'll go past the tipping point, it'll become irreversible, and the sea levels are going to rise 20, 20 feet or so in the next 40 or 50 years. Um, the kind of planet that our grandchildren will be living on will be determined by what we do now. They thought that at current levels of burning fossil fuel, we will pass the tipping point in 16 years. If we're going to get any kind of program started moving toward the light so that it's not just global disaster everywhere, we have to do something in the next year or two. Um, the Mayans, they, they uh, predicted that you know, for, from a decade after the junction, when you start a new age, things will become fully realized in about 10 years. So whatever pathway we're on after this December, in another 10 or so years by, you know, 2022, we'll be on one path or the other. And uh, on our present pathway, it looks like, uh, you know, planetary global destruction with 60-70% of the human race being forced to move inland as the sea levels rise 20 feet from the melting ice. Now, what can be done to prevent that? Well, the forces of light for several years have been saying we don't need to burn any fossil fuel. Um, Harvey Wasserman published a book in 2007 called Solar Topia, looking back from the year 2030, and he said that if we just went with what we have in 2007, like Germany has, 10,000 times more energy, light, falls on the planet every day than what we use. We collect one ten thousandth of it. If we just simply do start doing what Germany has been doing, then we can run the human race with no coal, no oil, no gas, no nukes, stop polluting. Uh, they said another thing, I just heard it an hour and a half ago, in the, in the last month, July, they said Germany produced more than half of the country's electricity from solar panels on roofs. For the first time in their history, their solar intake uh, was more than half of all you know, the electricity used in the country.
Germany already put up enough solar panels to shut down 20 nuclear power plants, and they're going after the rest. At current prices, um, one, one vendor from the energy fair out in Oregon uh, two weeks ago said that current solar panel prices are a dollar a watt. That used to be three dollars a watt just two or three years ago. Well, at a dollar a watt, solar energy is vastly cheaper than nuclear power, and it's cheaper than any kind of fossil fuel anywhere in the world. Yeah, so, on the one hand, me, you have people uh, teaching populations everywhere that the future, if we have one, belongs to solar, wind power, wave power, clean energy sources that are actually cheaper than what our big oil companies are selling us. On the other hand, the ages of, you know, the, the agents of darkness tell us that we have to keep our military occupying foreign countries and digging for oil, building new pipelines, and polluting the air for the next 30 years. So um, the choice, the choice week by week, month by month, just gets more and more and more clear about these global problems. I made, you know, I made a list. Uh, if you're, any of you are interested, you know, in uh, people that represent the forces of light, you had Avery Lovins from Rocky Mountain Institute, the architect Buckminster Fuller, Joan Shenton, and uh, the people at Channel Four in England, Peter Phillips, Mickey, Mickey Huff. To put out Project Censored, the Censored News Book every year that gives us the top 25 blacked out stories. Helen Collicott, John Goffman, 30 years, 40 years they've been writing about the alternatives to the disaster of nuclear power. David Ray Griffin, William River Smith, there's a whole list of people, literally thousands of people all over the world running thousands of good organizations, but generally speaking you don't hear about the good things in the American press. The American press covers rape, robbery, murder, train wreck, and plane crash. Those five categories, one of those is the lead story every night. And they fill the airwaves with 22 minutes of junk and eight minutes of commercials. So there's no time to tell us that builders have been building houses all over the place with no furnaces that heat for 10 bucks a month for the last 30 years in this country. Um, there's no time to tell us that the World Health Organization put out a report four years ago, June of 08, saying the AIDS epidemic is over. The only place you have to worry about getting AIDS is if you live in Africa. Other than that, it's not an infectious or sexually transmitted disease. Uh, these things should be good news, and they're not on any piece of the news. One of the things, one of the main issues right now you, you know, people are beginning to get worried about heading toward the junction, heading toward irreversible chaos if we don't go off in the other direction toward the light. Well, the forces of darkness run by the oil companies are producing something called fracking, hydraulic fracturing, where they pump chemicals into the ground to break up the rock to release natural gas. That process is known to contaminate and destroy the water tables in virtually every place that they do it. So they are rapidly destroying the fresh water supplies that people and animals depend on for life itself. If you can't get you know decent water to uh, irrigate you know land or whatever, you know, if you destroy the water table and all it's coming up is toxic chemicals, then that land becomes pretty much uninhabitable. And it's beginning to look like uh, the forces that are promoting hydraulic fracking, it's called fracking, are doing it for the money. That, you know, that is, they, they get uh, natural gas relatively cheap, or they think it is, but also they're developing a market for filtered water supplies sold to us by the big corporations that will be piping in clean water from places like Lake Michigan after thousands and thousands and thousands of wells out in farmland have been contaminated and destroyed. You know, fracking is, is a disaster of biblical proportions. The same thing as what happened in the Gulf of Mexico. 
the press in the United States has not reported the disaster in the Gulf of Mexico in any kind of uh, realistic portrayal of how big the disaster was. You know, the disaster in Mexico was 20 times bigger than the Exxon Valdez up in Alaska. And all along the coast of the Gulf of Mexico, uh, livelihoods of uh, fisheries, tourists, uh, all kinds of industries have just been flatly wiped out. So if the press had reported that rather than blacked it out, we would be well on our way to doing what Germany is doing, putting up solar panels, wind machines. Uh, there's a new uh, movie you might download from the internet called Zeitgeist and uh, the Venus Project. Those two things are a worldwide educational movement to change society from being a money-based society to a resource-based economy. Uh, there's several hours on those DVDs you can download for free. But they're talking about uh, changing living conditions where everybody would have enough food, everybody would have clean water, everybody would have a place to live, uh, you know, uh, in a cooperative effort. That's not communism at all. It's the next level of enlightenment, human awareness, that uh, we're all in the same boat. So, um, I don't know what to tell you. Let me show you something interesting. thing is a portable uh, solar uh, panel that you can take anywhere with you. Uh, it's a thin film variety, but these things cost about $50 now and the price is coming down. You can, um, you know, give yourself, um, if you're camping, these things will put out, collect enough sunlight to run lights, charge batteries, charge your cell phone. Uh, what? Well, uh, the new LEDs use about an eighth of uh, as much electricity as, as old lights do. There's a, a global revolution going on in the technology at all levels. Um, like Germany is finding out, you know, if, if, you, if you have good insulation in houses, you don't need a furnace. You need uh, the sunlight coming through the windows is enough to place to keep keep the place warm. The houses west of here in Schaumburg uh, went up in 1979. There's a bunch of them in Aurora. They heat for ten dollars a month. They have no furnace at all. They just have a tiny heating system and uh, good windows that don't lose really heat. Uh, companies, several companies are manufacturing the new windows now that have three three panes of glass, three layers of glass is all you need with a little better insulation in the walls. And the idea that you need a furnace for indoor human comfort, the idea that you would burn a lot of natural gas or any kind of fuel to maintain indoor comfort, that idea is completely obsolete. It's been obsolete for 35 years since the Canadians built a house like that up in Saskatchewan, northwest of Minnesota, where it's cold, in 1977. You talk about a, a, an agent for uh, promoting uh, the forces of light and good and moving into the next generation of high efficiency where we don't pollute the planet. Rocky Mountain Institute up in Colorado built a house in 1984. They had no heating bill and a five dollar month electric bill for a 3,000 square foot house because it was very, very efficient. The knowledge, the knowledge about how to live lightly on the planet without burning huge amounts of fossil fuel and contributing to global warming, that knowledge has been around for, uh, for decades now. But only in the last uh, 10 years or so have you know, the new, new light bulbs that will take the place of these fluorescent ones. The new LEDs are coming down in price. They can be manufactured dirt cheap just like these without mercury. And Restaurants like this one uh, could be run with a blend of solar cells on the roof and maybe a, a wind turbine out in the parking lot, like uh, the wind turbine that runs a restaurant called The Great Escape on, on Irving Park Road, uh, a few miles west of here, out near the airport. 
all the energy from there for that restaurant comes from their own windmill. It's like 100 feet high or something, but these things are being approved for use in uh, in communities. There's a you know there's as I said there's a global revolution in technology, heating, cooling, transportation is another one. Uh, the car companies have been testing 100 mile per gallon cars for over 30 years. Those uh, those vehicles, high efficiency vehicles, just aren't for sale yet on the roads of America, even though the various different models have been sold all over the world to get almost twice the mileage, is what the average car in America gets. We our, our whole economy has been managed for massive, massive profit. And that, that's what uh, Parlin and Steele are talking about You know, if there was, if there's any summary of what's happening along the dark side, you know how, how our society is heading toward the direction that the Mayans talked about, where you're just going downhill and things are getting worse and worse and worse. This book summarizes it. I'm not even three quarters of the way through it because I just got it in this last week. It's brand new, and it has a bunch of ideas in there for what people can do once we wake up and say. This is no longer acceptable. Now, we, we have to uh, somehow get there as a society and say that it, it's no longer acceptable to pay somebody seven or eight dollars an hour rather than eighteen dollars an hour because the CEO has to get twenty million a year. Uh, a lot of companies are like that now. Uh, they could be paying their they could be paying their people 18 20 25 dollars an hour with the money that they're paying to the top CEO or the owner of the business we're uh, we're in the final stages of shoveling money to rich people in this country you know, they, the gap right now is is wider than it's ever been you have to go back to the before 1929 the robber baron years when you have the philosophy of shoveling money to rich people at all costs it's, other countries are waking up. Uh, if you you log out of the internet, look at um, look at the look up the movie. Uh, there's several movies in the Zeitgeist uh, family of uh, education. It's in the Venus Project is the educational arm of that, talking about uh, working with different you know towns, villages all over the world to uh, collectively, from the grassroots, the ground up, transform humanity into what they call a resource-based society where things are distributed around the world rather than hoarded by rich people who have, you know, un un unconscionable amounts of money and resources. Um, one of the books over there, incidentally, if anybody wants to take home a copy, is a thing called the cancer stage of capitalism written by a Canadian John McMurtry in 1999. He talked about unregulated capitalism. It'll just grow. It starts out like a little cancer cell. It gets bigger and bigger and finally the tumor gets big enough that it will destroy the host. He talked about getting the final stages of more money, chasing money and more money and we saw this with the greed on Wall Street in the last decade. They, uh, in this country, the criminals just ran wild, and they, they opened the floodgates. Um, John, John Major Jenkins wrote, uh, this was published a year ago, he said, most dangerously, megamaniacal egotism's destructive and ignorant agenda is nauseatingly apparent in the political sphere today. The Maya prophecy for 2012 is literally verified in a person who appeared, ruled, and ruined so much while seeking to exercise great control over humanity, <coughs> all in service to his own selfish purposes. The prophesied appearance of Seven Macau came to pass, and his name was George W. Bush. <laughs> if there was, you know, I don't know how many other of you sense that shortly after 2001, 2002, that we were just living in 
the darkest age that America has seen in modern times. And that's where we are. And uh, we have to collectively choose, are we going to allow the agents of darkness to continue to dominate us as a population, or are we going to find some way to do something to move toward the light? As if, there were, if you watched any of the signs from those people, uh, the, you know, the 99% Wall Street Occupy, they said, you know, 99% of the people outnumber that 1% that is buying and selling our congressmen. You know, we, we outnumber the people that run the country. We outnumber them by, you know, hundreds, thousands to one. You know, there's 535 Congress people and 300 million Americans. Why is it that we're allowing our country to be run and dominated by these criminals? And this is, this is what the essence of the battle for the soul of humanity is all about. It's a fight between the agents of light and the agents of darkness. And one day, you know, you have to wake up and say, I'm not going to be part of the darkness anymore. Each of us can play some small part on some area that we're familiar with in, you know, moving humanity toward the light. There's, you know, there's, there's thousands of different things that we can do that are positive. You know, this country, uh, I don't know if any of you are involved in volunteering at schools. Um, a lot of the programs that are, are, are grade schools and middle schools exist on volunteers. There's just literally millions of people volunteering all over the country, you know, putting in time unpaid, uh, trying to help make things better for our kids growing up. And, um, you know, that, that kind of volunteer spirit exists in many other countries also. It, you know, you, people are not looking for saying, you know, you know uh, what can, how much money can I make here? What do I get out of it? But why don't we do something positive to help the kids? So, it's up to us. You know, we, we have, a, the, the choice is ours. You can, on the list of, uh, as I said, there's cards up here. I, I work with a group of what's called portal websites. Each one of them is a portal or a doorway into the other world where all the blacked out news is. The good news. You know, the, we get mostly bad news from the mainstream media that's owned by the billionaires in this country. The good news comes from various different websites where they're not supported by advertising dollars or anything. They're supported by donations from the readers and they're run by professionals who got sick and tired of the propaganda that comes out over the mainstream media in America. So, uh, you know, Common Dreams, Truth Out, Smirking Chimp are three of the best for uh, finding out what's happening in the political scene. Uh, Common Dreams is loaded, uh, Truth Out is loaded with environmental stories of all kinds, uh, beneficial things that are happening in countries all over the world. You know, a lot of people, an awful lot of people, are opting out of being part of, you know, the corporate culture that is destroying the planet. There's a, a global movement, a health revolution going on, so-called alternative health care, uh, things that work without using expensive medicines. See, the alternative health care movement is bigger than mainstream medicine now. The environmental movement toward um, efficiency of all kinds, uh, burning less fossil fuel, becoming more efficient, cleaner, greener. That movement on a global scale is huge, but the American press generally doesn't cover it. And so uh, we're, we're lagging behind other countries in the level of awareness of what can be done and also the level of what has been done. We're just behind because people don't know there's so many good things going on. I've been talking about houses without furnaces for 33 years now, and people are still shocked when they find out that you can have a house in Chicago that heats for $10 a month that looks like an ordinary house. 
they just people say, well, that can't be true, or that would be on the news. Uh, there's uh, re recently uh, one polling uh, political uh, group that does polling, the, you know, uh, like focus groups. You might find this interesting. Uh, focus groups were given the uh, the proposed budget. They didn't. They weren't told that it was. It came from Ryan or Romney. They were just told there's a group of politicians in America that uh, what do you think of these proposals? Uh, get rid of Medicare. Get rid of Medicaid. Get rid of Social Security. The focus groups. Uh, people that attended those groups said um, we don't believe this is real. You're, you're obviously making this up because uh, no no politicians would actually be that mean, nasty, corrupt, and criminal to try to actually pass something like this in America. People are, uh, because of the lack of coverage in the press, when people are presented with something that's real, uh, a lot of times they just don't believe it. They say, well, that can't be true. I, that, that would be on the news. And that's, that's one of the problems that we have dealing with new information. If, if it's something that uh, has been going on for years, but you don't know anything about it, then the initial reaction is what I call the Catholic Church Syndrome. <laughs> and everybody is familiar with the concept that the Catholic Church has a, a small problem with pedophile priests. And it's finally come out in the news. But if you go into a, a, you know, a Catholic Church and say on Sunday, uh, tell the congregation, hey, Father O'Malley has been molesting your kids for the last 12 years. Well, half the congregation will say, that can't be true. That, that's just too bad to believe. I'm not going to believe it. The other half of the congregation will say, if a shred of this is true, then we have an obligation to do something to protect our kids. And that's the philosophy that is spread through the hundreds of books that we've read, digested, published book reports on the last 25 years. These people say the first first step towards solving a problem is to actually admit and recognize, acknowledge the scope of the problem. You can't solve any kind of problem by attacking a messenger and saying, well, that can't be true, because if that were true, that would be on the news. Project Censored out of Sonoma State publishes a book every year with the top 25 stories that are blacked out. Stories that would change our country overnight if they were covered rather than blacked out. And so we have to find some way to help people overcome, you know, their, their natural fear uh, and, and closed-mindedness uh, and, and a reticence to face reality that might turn out to be a little scary at first. but. Once, I find, once you face the reality of the situation and look through it and say, what are the options? Uh, what, what kind of beneficial solutions do we have here? There, we, uh, we're, we're awash. We're just simply bombarded with beneficial solutions from all sides for all different kinds of problems if we open our minds to it. And this is what the environmentalists are talking about. We're bathed in free energy. Every day, 10,000 times more energy falls on us from the sun as light than what we use. All we need to do is collect a fraction of it, and we're on our way to a clean, green energy future yes, Bernie, with no coal, no oil, no gas, or no nukes. And we would stand a chance of averting the catastrophe that is now being projected and predicted by the climate scientists, along with people talking about Armageddon and the ancient Mayans talking about heading toward the junction where you have to choose between catastrophe and enlightenment. But they got the time frame right. We don't have five or ten years to mess around with this. Well, you know, if the climate scientists are anywhere near correct, then their time frame about getting something started, plus or minus a year or two, is very much what the ancient Mayans predicted thousands of years ago. It's all happening with a quickening, more and more energetic things happening all over the world on both pathways leading up toward the junction of December 21st, 2012, where we got a little less than, uh, a little over four months to go. So um, if you're interested in finding beneficial solutions, 
there's all kinds of sources all over the place. We're, we're just, we're, we're bombarded with beneficial solutions every day. Uh, there's so much so that there's, there's no time to read more than a fraction of what is published. So you have to look at credible sources to find out, you know, what's credible and what isn't. So, with that, I think we'll just open it up to questions. Okay. All right, I see you have a very kind as a question. Yes, uh, Andy, uh, I would agree, and I think many of the people in this room would agree that, uh, yeah, we're headed toward an ecological disaster. And it just happens to be right around these times, uh, 2012. And you've tried tying this into the Mayan calendar. Do you have any hard proof that uh, the Mayans knew that something like this was going to happen? Or is this just a coincidence? Uh, the question is, do we have any hard proof? Uh, there's some book reports up here for, you know, you can collect what you want before you leave. And uh, if you want to take a book, help yourself. Uh, sure. Sure. Bernie asks, uh, do the Mayans have any proof, or is it just a coincidence that uh, their date happens to coincide with a, uh, an avalanche of good and bad things happening over the last five to seven years in, in, on the world scale. Uh, I don't know how you could say there's proof other than the fact that we're seeing greater and greater environmental uh, storms, uh, catastrophes, uh, human problems, uh, what they talked about, a quickening of good things and bad things on, you know, the light and the darkness, it's just, it's accelerating. More and more is happening year by year, and we're, we're living in it, we're watching it. We'll, all, we'll, we'll have to wait until December 21st to see if some big thing happens right. with a magnetic polar shift like some scientists are talking about. The poles of, uh, the magnetic poles of the Earth have shifted several times over the eons, and they, they think that that might be related to one of the great planetary alignments also. But nobody really knows yet. <laughs> Are you going to monitor? You want me to answer that? Yeah. Is there any other uh, predictions uh, that was made by the calendar of any other disaster besides the fact that there would, in the northern reaches of old Mexico, would arise a person whose last name was Bush that was kind of <laughs> no. Terrible things. I mean, that, that's really like totally vague. I have to tell you. Is there any, anything that's very specific about what happened? That's that's. Do you want more tea or you okay? In, no. in the in the blurb for this, it said that, it, that there were several predictions that it made. Were there any others besides just the general one? Uh, I don't. I did not see any um, in in the. The Mayans didn't make specific date predictions in events like Nostradamus did. That's a totally different kind of thing. Uh, no, they, they just simply predict that there will be uh, a, a resurgence of activity, more and more uh, quickening of events happening as you lead up to the end of one cycle and the beginning of another. And they say this, this has happened uh, at the beginning and end of cycles going back, you know, uh, you know, thousands and thousands and thousands of years. This isn't the first cycle that humanity has gone through with the end of one cycle and the rebirth of, of another one. But no, I did not run across any specific uh, predictions where politicians were named as such in the prophecies, no. Uh, Bob Matter? No, Bob, okay. Hey, Andy, can you give us a brief synopsis of the, of the history of the Mayan civilization? When, did, when were they around and how did they uh, disappear and that kind of thing? <laughs> a, a brief synopsis of the Mayan civilization would take a half an hour. No, uh, you know, the, the Mayans, most of the Mayans uh, disappeared a few hundred years ago. Um, and they just left, you know, nobody knows really where they went. Um, 
and that's that's part of the mystery. Um, you know, I, I encourage you to read some books on it and study it, um, and, and maybe you know you can become more of an expert than the rest of us here. How long? How long were they around? What was those? Uh, I, I think they were around, uh, you know, several thousand years, uh, but uh, it's they didn't leave. Uh, as much evidence as the Egyptians did, as, as my understanding. But they were in Mexico? Yeah, the Mayans were in Mexico and in a few other places. But Guatemala and Belize and Mexico. Yeah, but uh, no, I, I'm not an expert on Mayan culture per se. Uh, you know, my talk was on the, the prophecies as they relate to what's happening leading up to the junction in 2012 here in December. That's, that's what I have studied. And Tim? Okay, uh, I'm just curious, you know, you gave a lecture on several blacked out news stories and trends, but you didn't really mention a lot about specific Mayan prophecies. And I was hoping to hear a little bit more about the Mayans and about the prophecies themselves. Could you comment on, on that part of the speech a little bit more, please? Okay, um, as, as I tried to answer Bob, the, the Mayan prophecies aren't specific about saying uh, there will be an earthquake in Japan that will blow up a nuclear power plant on such and such a date. The Mayans didn't leave uh, prophecies like that. They, uh, the, the, the whole philosophy of their teaching is that uh, things happen in long cycles of time and you have the end of one age, the rebirth of another, and a lot of times the end of one age ends in some kind of planetary, you know, cataclysmic uh, disaster, um, cataclysmic. Um, so we don't know. We, we, you know, if we knew it was going to happen on December 21st, it would be published all over the world. Okay, uh, Charles? Oh, I'm sorry, you had your hand up first. Uh, yes, uh, I'm sorry. I no, it's okay. You can your name. Your name again, sir? I'm Andy. Andy. Andy, uh, in looking at the Mayans, were you able to encounter any information about the Hopi prophecy? Um, not, not much. Other uh, indigenous... The Hopi prophesied people. almost the same thing. Well, but, can, uh, can, can, if I could, I, I can fill you in on you know, the, spe the specifics of some of the Hopi stuff because I was uh, in privilege to uh, to be with uh, Tomas Binyaka, one of the elders of the Hopi Kiva Society, you know, and he, and he began to uh, explain what, in fact, was prophesied. I'd be happy to share that. We could do it during the rebuttal period. Okay, during the rebuttal period? Yeah. Okay, yeah. Yes, please. please. Share, share that one. Sure. Okay. Because I, I did not study uh, the Hopis all right. at all. Uh, yes, Charles. Yes. What what method did the Mayans use to arrive at this information? Or is this truth by revelation, which is common to every religion that's ever existed on earth? Namely, a priestly guy said he got a revelation. Um, okay, that's, this, that's a good question. Uh, you're, you're asking what, what method did they use to arrive at their revelation? Well, where did it come from? Um, well, it, it, it's simply based on their, their concept of the long cycles of time and how uh, time runs in cycles related to the movement of the sun, the stars, you know, the galaxy, the, the, where we fit in the solar system. Their, their whole system is not one of um, uh, prophecy from a divine religion, where it just comes out of some religious view. You know, their, their, their system was based on, uh, you know, their intricate calendar. Um, and uh, they had cycles of uh, 5,000 year cycles, 2,000 year cycles. What? Many cultures have calendars, and specifically Egyptians, Babylonians, and a number of others. Well, in my... Fact, Better calendars. Well, I, I can't address that because I didn't study the others. All I can tell you is, from where I'm standing, it appears that you know, the Mayan prediction for the end of this year, this, this period in time and what's been happening over the last 10 years, 
you know, their their predictions are kind of what happens over the 10 years leading up to the junction and uh, the t what happens 10 years after that. You know, they they appear to have gotten this the time frame more correct than anything else I've ever seen. So they were just really good at calendar making. Well, I think so. Uh, Bob Batter. Okay. Yeah, Andy, if, uh, now the, the forces of darkness uh, more or less win out here at the end. Does this, does this mean that things are going to be bad for some period of time and then there'll be a chance for a, uh, another? Uh... Okay, uh, if, if the force, uh, the question is if the force of the darkness went out, uh, how, how long will things be bad or will it get better? Well, if, if uh, the forces of darkness actually prevail and we don't make a dent in global warming or stop the destruction of the planet, then things will get bad for 80 to 90 percent of the human race. 70 percent of the human race lives near uh, seaside, you know, ocean, you know, coastal areas. 70 percent of humanity is going to have to move inland and migrate uh, away from the sea level rising 20 feet and wiping out coastal cities all over the world. Uh, I don't, you know, nobody has any idea how humanity is going to be able to cope with that. You know, there, there will be some survivors, but, you know, we'll, you know, all of those of us that are 50, 60 years old will be gone. But our kids, 30, 40 years from now, 50 years from now, they're going to be, you know, living somewhere else away from the coast. And uh, whether or not industrial society can survive that, a lot of people think no. So I, if you want my opinion, I'm wondering if the rich people are, are uh, eliminating the middle class and stockpiling money in order to build some kind of spaceship in orbit uh, that would take a few hundred rich people and just uh, orbit around the Earth after the, the disaster, like what's portrayed in some of the Hollywood movies. That's the only thing that makes sense to me with billionaires saying, um, I, I only got 70 billion in the bank. I need hundred another 100 billion before I can send my kids to college. I mean, we're, we're seeing insane, immoral, in, insane behavior on a level that hasn't been seen in the human race. In, you know, in a long, long time, and it's that's what we're seeing. You know, we're 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 in virgin territory almost every month with something new coming up where people just can't believe it's getting this bad, or that uh, we're not addressing the problems. So it, it, it's another you, you could you could make a list of these problems and have a have a debate on that for an evening of uh, what can be done. But it, go ahead. Does that answer your question, Bob? Thank you. Any other questions? Yes. All right. Your prediction on when the Cubs are going to win the World Series. <laughs> well, I'm pretty sure the Cubs might win the World Series after December 21st. We'll have to wait and see. But, uh, <laughs> Sometime, some My own opinion, not anytime soon. Many centuries but away. We'll have to wait and see. Yeah. yeah, in a word, are you calling for a scientific revolution or a political revolution or both? His question was, am I calling for a scientific or a political revolution or both? And the answer is yes. Uh, a scientific revolution uh, using clean technology, the best that we have, and a political revolution to basically <coughs> have some kind of system where criminals aren't running our lives. Right now, America is, is being run and dominated by uh, billionaire corporate criminals, and like nothing we've seen in 100 years. And this is, this is spelled out in a whole bunch of books that are talking about what happened in the last decade as we opened the floodgates in 2000 and the criminals just ran wild. Follow up if I may. Yeah. How do you deal with the uh, presence, the undeniable presence of corporate criminals at the highest level when in order to be in a position to deal with them, you have to be able to get elected to a high enough office, Congress, the Senate, the presidency, which you don't do unless you get fast donations from these very people that uh, we all want to see go. Uh, the question of you basically what what can we what can we do on the political level if it takes a lot of money to get elected in the first place well um, 
William Rivers Pitt, who uh, wrote a book called The Greatest Sedition is Silence. He published that in, I think it was 2000, a year before 9-11 happened. But since then, he's run a website called Truth Out. He published an article uh, like four days ago saying why he's not going to vote for Jill Stein, the good uh, Green Party candidate, who would be an excellent uh, presidential candidate. But he said, you have to do something at the grassroots level to build, build a base where you can get people to vote uh, and win electoral votes. We have an electoral college and a two-party system in this country. We have to work within the system in order to change it. And that means uh, organizing at the grassroots level. Uh, a lot of people came out, and people that had never voted, went to the polls in 2008 because they were trying to put an end to the, the criminal reign that had been dominating our country for eight years, for that eight-year stretch. So um, the, my answer is that the first, the first step starts with helping people understand who the criminals are and what's happening. And uh, you know, not enough of the public. I mean, we, we shouldn't have 2% of this public thinking that they're going to vote Republican because the Republican Party is totally dominated by corporate criminals. And if you don't have criminal tendencies, it's hard to get elected as a Republican uh, because they will run somebody against you in the primary. You know, we have to wake up and, and face our system as it is and, and look at what's being done all over the world. Okay. I, I have uh, uh, perhaps more to say question. Uh, I've noticed that uh, solar power, uh, while it is very great, uh, is not outside here uh, tonight uh, uh, and uh, wind power uh, tends to uh, fall off a bit at night uh, or, or from time to time. Uh, uh, the question then is one of storage and transmission of power. Uh, what are the answers on that? Uh, the, the question, you know, it's a common question, well, the sun doesn't shine at night and the wind's not blowing all the time everywhere. Well, uh, Amory Lovins made the point in, in the book Reinventing Fire, he said uh, power stations, coal stations or nuclear stations, coal <coughs> stations, uh, there's power stations that are shut down in various places. They're not running, they're down for maintenance, they're not running 24 hours a day. and. If you get enough wind machines up in various places and they're all feeding energy into the grid, the wind's always blowing somewhere. Solar energy can collect a lot of energy during the day when people actually use it. And also uh, there's different kinds of storage technologies that are getting better and better. But um, if I were going to build a house today, you could, uh, you could run a solar house with uh, almost the equivalent of uh, half a dozen car batteries, boat batteries. You don't have to have a whole room full of batteries to store solar energy so that you have lights in the refrigerator running at night. Um, you can easily store uh, solar energy from the daytime in a handful of ordinary batteries if the house is ultra efficient in the first place. And that's what the future should look like. Yes, Charles? <laughs> oh, uh, Russell. Hey. Russell, you have a kind of question. Yeah. yeah. When you build your house super efficient, how much more is that going to cost over a conventional home? When you build a house super efficient, how much does it cost over a uh, conventional home? Well, the builders in Davis, Colorado, uh, in Davis, California, have been building efficient houses with no central heating and cooling system for the last 20 years or so, and uh, those houses cost just a tad less than ordinary houses across the street. It does not cost any more to make a house energy efficient. You do things differently. You take the furnace money and spend it on the walls and windows, then you don't need a furnace. So a house with the building techniques we have today, an energy efficient house that we heat for about 10 bucks a month would cost just about the same or a tad less to build than an ordinary house that most builders are building. So there's not this giant gap we've been told sold by the press 
you know, you got to spend a half a million dollars more on solar panels to make your house energy efficient. That, that's, you know, that's 20 years obsolete thinking. Okay? Log on to the website, Rocky Mountain Institute, and, you know, take one of the cards here that has these websites listed, and you find a wealth, a total wealth of knowledge on that. You, you, you said, you said, well, I won't quote you, but you said who is running our country, and you call them thieves. There are other names they can be called. However, we agree. When I say thieves, I'm talking about me and you. We agree. However, there's a contradiction when you answer Pat's, Pat's question. If X is running the goddamn country, how can A and B, that they got shit to do with that, can come in and say, I'm president and I'm running the country? You follow that? I mean, how, other, other words, the pre, does the president have knowledge? I, I'm, I'm sorry. Does the president have the legal power? Forget about his upbringing. Because when he get there, it all depends on reality. If the president will he have the legality in the tools to step out and say, I want my country back, and point fingers and call names, like me and you are these thieves ass cocksuckers? Does he? That's the question. Does the president have that power? Does he have that legal uh, 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 tool to take the country back? Any president? That's a tough question. Um, I thought, well, you know, I've asked that for years myself. You know, does the president have the power to take the country back or uh, to fight the criminals? Um, I think it depends on the time uh, and the, the mood of the public. Like, you know, uh, the mood of the public was solidly behind Franklin Roosevelt when he called out the criminals. He said, you know, the, the bankers hate me, and I welcome their hatred. He called them out. John F. Kennedy in 1963 was getting ready to dismantle parts of the CIA. He didn't like their dirty tricks all over the world, and he got killed for it. Um, I think myself, personally, I think if 90%, 80% of the country is behind something, then it's much more uh, politically possible for a president to step out and oppose that half of 1% of the criminals that has been buying and selling our Congress. You know, the president has a bully pulpit, uh, but, it, you know, it, there's still a debate going on about how much power the president has or what he can actually do without getting assassinated by the same forces that, that got took out John F. Kennedy, Martin Luther King. Senator Paul Wellstone was recently assassinated in 2002, 10 days before the election, because he was the tipping vote. So we, we have, when, when people of conscience step out and are in a position to make a difference, rather than just make some noise, uh, bad things happen sometimes. That's a good. That's a good answer, and that's why I like you. That's a good answer. You absolutely right. If the people got behind it, well, he could do it, but he can't do it on the Yes, you've talked about um, lower cost for initially building buildings that are, say, energy efficient. And uh, what about retrofitting existing buildings? I'm thinking most specifically of the restaurant at 4008 North Lincoln, what could be done to retrofit this so we have some goddamn heat in the wintertime? <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, a simple thing that can be done, uh, there's a, a you know, they, you can paint the walls in the ceiling with a new thermal paint that's a heat blocker. Their uh, Home Depot and some others sell, they're called ceramic paints. They have little microscopic chips of ceramic material like what the heat shield tiles on the space shuttle are made up so that it doesn't burn up on re-entry. Well this paint is a heat blocker. You just paint a layer on the walls and you can paint any color over it and it's like adding six inches of fiberglass insulation to the wall. Uh, there's a whole bunch of things that could be done to a place like this and it wouldn't cost that much to improve our comfort level in here somewhat. 
Someone needs to talk to management. Yeah, the, the first thing is to talk to management and see if they can move the thermostat up or down. Charles, <laughs> Yeah, I've got a real question. <laughs> I'm somewhat curious how a society or a civilization that somehow developed the ability to predict the future and have the gift of prophecy, why they no longer exist. In fact, they no longer exist. They succumb to a bunch of thugs. They have no, no intelligence at all. They're just brutes. This is quite a skill. And they couldn't use it for their own self-preservation. Charlie's asking, uh, couldn't they use it for their own self-preservation? Well, one of the books on uh, the Mayan civilization that I read, one author said it appears that after the Mayans had uh, became satisfied with what they had accomplished on Earth, they just walked back into the jungle and disappeared and went back from where they came from. Uh, one author said uh, he, he's... Um, one Mayan scholar had said that you know the Mayans were galactic travelers, and this was the seventh seventh uh, you know uh, solar system that they had mapped out in their travels by the time they got here. Uh, they were aliens? No, not aliens, but maybe they had help. I think they had help myself, but I'm, I'm waiting to see uh, if there's proof. I mean, we know the Egyptians had help building the pyramids. They certainly were, weren't rolling those stones. Uh, big stones over logs from the riverbed. You know, the Egyptians had massive engineering help. High technology help to build, you know, the, 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 the Great Pyramid in Giza. These artifacts exist around the world, and as we get better and better measuring tools and stone cutting tools and everything else, we can realize that the ancient people weren't using hammers and chisels and doing these things by hand. So there's a whole lot more going on, going back thousands of years, than uh, what our, our, our modern you know, uh, news is, is talking about. There's a whole body of knowledge out there you can look up. And it's being reported more in other countries than Just here. Just one follow-up question. In the tombs of Egypt, there's a scripture by the workmen. I don't know the what that teams, is. They gave themselves teams. Now, if they were built by guys like me who formed teams and gave them team number 12, and how do you explain these in scripture? We if should probably... Uh, there, the there's, workmen's camps. Well, there, there's all kinds of different camps where people work, ancient people work. All we're saying is that there are some artifacts on the world that weren't made with simple hand tools. You got a question here? Yeah. Let this, go ahead. Emily Hoffman. Uh, my question is, um, like you know, you're talking about how the bigger or the 99 percent, you know, could do something because we outnumber the people actually running things. Like if all of us got together. But my question to you is, I don't know, like if it. I don't know if there's any truth to it or not. Just, you know, I've learned about it on the internet. I'm not sure how credible the sources are. But I watched a couple of videos on YouTube uh, showing footage of like uh, like FEMA camps being like turned into like a sort of like a facility that could be like a potential concentration camp for say a large number of people rebelling against the government. Like they were showing like an old old uh, train station that was being like repaired and shut You know what I'm talking about? What's your question? My question is, is do you think that the, we would get, you know, something would happen to us if we tried to do something? Well, the question is, uh, like, would, would they try and put us in, say, a, some sort of concentration camp? Yeah, this, this lady asked a question about uh, what would happen if Americans tried to do something in large enough numbers to make a difference. Well, um, you know, from Gandhi's time on down, they stressed, you know, nonviolent action if, if it's taken in large numbers, if people just don't go along with the program. Uh, you know, no government can really handle millions and millions of people. Even the military. The, uh, 
No, uh, we think we're not that far gone as a country yet where uh, they could just throw millions of people in several concentration camps. But uh, small numbers of protesters, the, the point is if, if we don't speak out when journalists are arrested for trying to film police brutality, if we don't speak out and educate everybody that this is what's going on, then you know they get away with it over the cover of darkness. You know, uh, we we have to collectively speak out, and uh, the internet is still free and very active. Without the internet, we wouldn't be able to find out one one hundredth they, of what's really going on. Can they shut the internet down? And nobody really knows if they can shut the internet down. They probably have the capability to do that. But there's a whole bunch of people. There's a lot of businesses. All kinds of people use the internet. You know, it would be a big disaster for business if the internet were shut down. So you know, the internet is is global, and uh, it's it's a good force to promote beneficial knowledge that it would have taken you years to find out. You can find out in minutes or you know an hour or two on the internet. They can take over the internet. Like, yeah. Well. Um, Especially the private home. We could get lots of error messages. Uh, you know, the goal, you know, ultimately the goal will be to take over the internet and control the content so that people can't find out what's going on. That's that's the dark side we're talking about. There are people that think we, we, we can't have an educated population because they might get out of line and they might demand things that uh, are more in line with, you know, a decent human living rather than being debt slaves to the bank or wage slaves. Yeah, on the other hand, uh, you know, it's often said that uh, tyrants of any kind don't like a particularly well-educated population. Right. But in today's world, isn't it impossible to run a modern nation state without a well-educated, very capable population? So you've got to educate people in order to keep your regime in power. Well, um, I think uh, he, he asked, is, do you have to have an educated population to, to keep the regime in power? Uh, not necessarily. I mean, uh, you know, the, the I mean, we're not talking about some banana republic or the Middle East or whatever. We're talking about a you know modern superpower, mm -hmm. which requires you know all kinds of things that only an educated kid or a deliver. We're also talking about the Chicago public school system. <laughs> That's training, not education. That's well, training. Uh, I think a, a comment that we haven't noticed is, uh, you know, we have college-educated people in this country who uh, believe in certain kinds of mythology that, uh, that is promoted by the mainstream media. Just getting a college degree and being educated doesn't mean that you're aware of what's really going on in the country or how the political system works. Or, or what we can do, what kind of freedoms we have if we think creatively, think out of the box. You know, a great example, you know, we used to get almost in, get into fist fights 30 years ago. Just 30 years ago, if you talked about having a smoke-free restaurant and you asked somebody to put out a cigarette, that they, you know, could you maintain your, you know, hold off for 20 minutes until we get through with our meal here? People would just look at you in a state of disbelief. I have a God-given right to light up and puff away anywhere. That was 30 years ago. Now, look at what we've got. The public has accepted. We're all on the same page. We moved in the positive direction. It's easier for everybody to breathe when you're having a meal because we have non-smoking restaurants. This is what we're talking about, a beneficial knowledge of the, the public getting collectively behind an idea whose time has come. And uh, I, I think the idea whose time has come is that we have to do, we have to collectively do something about a handful of people enriching themselves at, you know, the the the, the effect they're having. They're they're just they're they're stealing from. You know, we have we have a system that takes from the poor and the middle class and shovels money into the bank accounts of billionaires. America is running the greatest welfare for billionaire system that the human race has ever seen. And we, have, our population has not spoke out in large enough numbers to make a difference yet. That's one of the things we have to do. That's what, it's what it means to go toward the light rather than just 
stay in the darkness and don't say anything and just let, let things keep going on as they are. And will you want to follow up? Uh, I just wanted to ask you one more question. Um, do you think that when we watch the news we're being blatantly lied to or do you think they're just not covering things that are happening that they don't want to? Emily asked if uh, when we watch the news are we, we being blatantly lied to or are they just not telling us things, right? Yeah. Well, uh, one author said that the greatest lies are the ones that are told when you're giving little pieces of truth but you're leaving out things. You didn't say anything that was untrue but you left out enough of the pieces of the puzzle to give a totally false picture of what's really going on. The other half of that is Yes, on Fox News. Fox News is used as an example by journalism schools of how to promote lies and propaganda. They won a court case when they fired two of their reporters because the reporters wouldn't lie on the air. They wouldn't lie in a story and just lie to the American people. They wanted to tell the truth about growth hormones and milk that were affecting the development of young people. And so they got fired, they sued for wrongful termination, and the judge ruled in favor of Fox. They said, Fox News has no obligation to tell the truth in any of their broadcasts. They can make stuff up and just put it out there and just flat out lie to us on certain you know, kinds of things. You get, they, they might tell you the truth on the weather. If it's 78 degrees outside and they say it's 78, well, yeah, that's telling the truth. But on a lot of other things, no, Fox News is... They're banned in certain sections of Canada because they're not recognized as a news source. They're recognized as a propaganda outlet of the criminals that have taken over the Republican Party in this country. Okay. That's who Fox News is. So, you know, there's, but the, the alternative is there's a bunch of good websites that post breaking news from all over the world every day, the best of the best, and you can look it up, you find out it's credible and the stuff isn't proven to be false two or three days later. You know, the internet is a fantastic educational tool for finding out in real time what's happening. Arlene? Yeah. Don't you think that people are going to read newspapers and watch mm -hmm. that uh, inform that their already preconceived notions about things just to justify their thinking or to support your thinking? So you're already have these ideas and they're going to watch like Fox News because they agree with the way they control the uh, She asked, are people going to read newspapers and watch news that uh, conforms to their already pre-existing notions? Well, she's absolutely correct. Uh, people that listen to Rush Limbaugh think that they're getting uh, the straight scoop on what's happening when he is the highest paid intellectual prostitute on the planet. <laughs> the man's a genius. He can take any kind of criminally insane bullshit and make it sound like common sense for the ordinary person on the fly, in real time. He doesn't have to think about it. He, he's been saying for years he has talent on loan from God. Well, I say he has talent on loan from Satan. Uh, people, <laughs> like this that. is one of the problems in America. You hit the nail on the head. People will look to sources that uh, reinforce their mythological beliefs that are, have no basis in reality. You know, we have people walking around that you know have no. They're, they're informed on some things, but they have no, not a clue that they have beliefs that have no basis in reality on other things. And that's what a lot of these internet news sites are trying to help people learn. Uh, here's what is happening, how does this story differ from what was just reported on Channel 7 or Channel 5? You know, if, if, if you, Professor Griffin said, you don't need an open mind, you just need to open your mind 30%. Just you know, open it 30% and look at the evidence. On almost any key subject, if you do that, you'll find out that a lot of things are easy to understand once you put all preconceived notions behind you. Does that make any sense at all? Yeah. Yes. Question. How do I have a question? Yeah, how do you do that? How do you get people, how do you go to the core of their emotions and force them to make reality? Peter means the head with a two by four. That's the only way. 
That I, that's what I've been asking for the last five years. How, how do you get people to open their minds a little bit and look at evidence without any preconceived notions? And once you do, well, a lot of people won't do that because they sense they're afraid of what they're going to see. They, and it's, it's a, you know, a lot of people are living in a fearful bubble that they will, you know, this is why we have the Catholic Church Syndrome. The congregation wouldn't face that for years and years and years because if it's true, we have to do something, right? And this is where we are today. We're, kind of, we're headed toward the junction of planetary disaster for the human race, and a whole bunch of people are thinking, well, uh, we can just burn fossil fuel for the next 40 years. The world is fair. I feel like the evil people that have made themselves with the face of like patriotism and good Christian values, how do we separate good Christian values and patriotism from republicanism or evil or whatever it is when they have this huge following. The question is how do we separate um, you know good Christian values or whatever from uh, the evil that we're seeing uh, people you know people have adopted they're doing evil things in the in the, in the, in the in the name of Christianity, they're they're what I call anti-Christ Christians. They they claim to be Christians, but their doctrine, things they're doing, is opposite of the teachings of Christ, right on down the line. And we've allowed those people to take over, like they've taken over the the Air Force Academy out in Colorado. They're teaching uh, you know young Air Force people coming into the Air Force and military that you're on a mission from God to bomb people into a, a, a submission all over the world if they don't, uh, if they oppose uh, American doctrine. You know, Jerry Falwell was given Bible prophecy at the meetings in the Pentagon in 1986 to teach our generals how to read the end time signs of the Middle East War, launch our missiles in the spring of 87, and get rid of the Soviet Union and fulfill Bible prophecy according to uh, their interpretations of it. The public if we had found out about that, there would have been massive protests. But since we don't find out about it, we didn't have the internet back then. All we had was mainstream news. So if they could keep something off television, off the radio, the public didn't know this stuff was going on. That's my point. We ha we still have the internet. We have all kinds of sources. We have, uh, you know, uh, we have uh, the ability now. That, that one hour video uh, it can be downloaded and carried around on one of these little jump drive things for five or six bucks. You know, uh, an eight megabyte, uh, eight, it's eight gigabytes. Uh, that's enough to hold uh, like three or four or five hours of video or thousands and thousands of pages of material. We have the ability to exchange information and videos and uh, other kinds of letters, you know, articles cheaply. You can get, you know, get things out to people where you don't have to take the time to read a whole book. Nobody's got time to read 15 or 20 books a week. You know, that's the problem. There's a, a, a massive amount of knowledge that's out there and really beneficial stuff, but there's there's no time for the average person. So you have to pick and choose. And, and, and go with sources that are credible. Let's go to a Mr. Connie. Yes, uh, do you feel that uh, the past few years the media has blacked out news about fracking? Well, uh, you know, the question is, you know, do I feel that the media has blacked out the news about fracking? Uh, yes. Uh, they're, they're getting ready to try to issue a bunch of permits in southern Illinois. Uh, the, wherever, wherever the public finds out about fracking, they protest. I mean, it's a disaster of biblical proportions. I mean, uh, fracking just destroys people's groundwater and livelihood and the ability to live over certain areas of land. I have a follow-up on this. Would you consider CBS's 60 Minutes major media? Well, 60 Minutes has always been considered major media, but they don't cover some things they either. They most certainly covered fracking, and they even had one of their infamous reruns. Uh, and they, they, they covered the fracking story, didn't they? They and sure they, did. That's what, yeah. well, what, what I'm talking about is that the other media don't cover it in large enough numbers to get the story out to the public. 
you know, if you co if you cover a story once somewhere, and it was on one hour, or they might have run a rerun, but that still doesn't reach a large segment of the public. You have to you have to cover it with the same energetic enthusiasm that they tell us about Tiger Woods' girlfriends or Lindsay Lohan going to rehab. I, I don't think I could live if I didn't know about Kim Kardashian's new boyfriend. <laughs> they, these things are in the media, uh, you know, and uh, all the tabloids, they keep us well informed on junk food news. But the public, if you look, 60 Minutes did cover it, but take a survey of your own. Find out how many people understand that the water coming out of your tap, you can light it on fire with a cigarette lighter or a match because it's flammable. Once there's fracking in your area and your wells get in the farmland, your wells get contaminated with benzene and toluene and all kinds of toxic fire, uh, you know, re explosive volatile chemicals. They're, they're cancer causing, cancer, leukemia, genetic defects, all kinds of things from the chemicals they're using to pump down into these wells for fracking. I mean, there, there's way more to the fracking story than what we're told. Way, way more. And it's a disaster for ordinary people at all levels. Yes, when can we go to rebuttals? <laughs> I still got my hand up for almost a right, They want real questions. Right we're getting close. Yeah, let him chair the meeting, huh? <laughs> <laughs> let him chair or him. All right. You got a question, I'd Charlie? Say, yeah, I do. I. Global warming, I'm just reading the book here and it doesn't mention anything about... What book is that, Charlie? Al Gore's. What? Al Gore's. <coughs> what? Al Gore's book. It doesn't mention anything about the Mayans and it seems to me that global warming was discovered by modern scientists and geologists and I don't understand how, what's the connection or nexus with ancient history and archaeology. I mean, global warming has nothing to do with the field of archaeology. Charlie says global warming has nothing to do with the field of archaeology. Well, he's probably true. <laughs> we, we, uh, there's all kinds of artifacts you can dig up all over the world that you know, don't tell us a whole lot about global warming as it's happening now. I mean, I mean I've we, studied archaeology of the Greenhead, and I've never once came across anything that's a related to You might have missed warming. the point I was trying to make. You know, the, the Mayans didn't mention global warming specifically. They talked about a whole bunch of things happening that leads up to collectively planetary disaster this way or avert planetary disaster and go toward the light. And they got the time frame right. We are that, we're living right in that time headed toward the junctions. And each month more and more scientific studies are published. Stuff coming out of NASA just last week, James Hansen said, we grossly underestimated how fast the ice is melting in several places around the world and how fast we're getting these big cyclic climate changes. As, as we get closer and closer to the junction and you see more and more ice melting, they get a better and better picture of how fast it's happening. They're constantly revising their forecasts each year saying we got less and less time to really get our act together or this becomes irreversible. Once the permafrost in Russia thaws out and melts, the sea level comes up 20 feet and Manhattan's underwater. And that, that's pretty much it for our normal civilization. We'll have to adjust to a new planet. That's what There's they're talking about. about. How does the entire field of archaeology miss this? They didn't have modern measuring equipment two, three hundred years ago. That's how they missed it. You know, up until a few hundred years ago, nobody had telescopes, I mean, much before Galileo's time. It's a whole different field, Charlie. All right, you have something to say. We have these chairs lined up here. Rebuttals. 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 I would like to know how many of you have 
remarks to make to the rest of us. Uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, thirty-five minutes each. It's about five minutes from thirty-five minutes each. Uh, an hour apiece. <laughs> up to uh, five minutes each, and then we'll see uh, what your reaction is. All right. Five, Let's begin. thank our speaker. Yes. 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 Uh, first of all, I want everybody to understand that I think that Andy is an honest person. He he believes what he tells you. However, he reads bullshit and he translates it into what he believes is, is logical or not. There are a lot of things that he says that they are really true. We are really fucking up the environment. We are doing as you may hear me before, we are throwing 4,500 tons of plastic shit into the sea every day, about a billion tons of plastic shit into the sea every year, is changing the temperature of the sea, is changing the chemistry of the sea, is changing the fauna of the sea. This is a disaster that is going to hunt us for thousands of years. This is nothing, something that you can clean by any technology that you can invent. This is there forever. It is there to stay. And the plastic is being uh, ground to find particles and is absorbed by the phytoplankton, by the plankton, and so on for the higher lives until everybody has absorbed it too. Uh, this is uh, really uh, an experiment that we are doing with life that is it's, it's just never ending because it will stay, like I said, for years. Now, as far as education and what Butler brought up, any, any civilization like ours, very technological, need people that they are trained. <coughs> However, education, as it is today, is leading to barbarism. Because the education is creating people who are specifically trained to one particular thing, but nothing else. Don't think, don't think for yourself, don't analyze what's going around you, concentrate and produce what we tell you to produce. For example, something that we will suffer for a long time is the genetically modified seeds who are hybrids, if you understand what that means, you plant that seed, and when you get the plants out of it, you cannot use the seeds from that plant to plant more seeds. So whenever any country or any people adapt those seeds, they are hooked forever into buying from Monsanto the next crop of seeds. This is a slavery of a kind that we never even dreamed before. But we are getting into this with the collaboration of our government pushing other governments to accept these seeds as replacement for the seeds that they were using for hundreds of thousands of years. Now this is prob these problems need thinking heads, not automats, not idiots that they know how to make a chemical to produce a bomb or a, or a fuel for a rocket. We need people to think. And in order for us to learn how to think, we have to have forums like these, and maybe smaller forums where we get together with friends and we dialogue in a profound way, in a way that we teach each other how to analyze this magnificent world that we live in. We have to admire it, we have to love it, but we also have to understand it. And we are not going to do it if you go to the fucking school that they are training to be you a chemist, that you are going to work for Monsanto or other companies that's going to exploit you. We are not slaves. We shouldn't allow ourselves to be slaves. And I will ask you 
to pay a moment of silence for those miners who died this week in South Africa because they were asking for a better salary. The only, the only improvement in their lives is the road that goes from their shanty town to the mine. They don't have no schools, no water, no health. They go to the mine, back and forth. And they are asking for a better salary. And they're shutting down, cold-blooded. You have to see, you have to hear this volley of bullets coming and coming and coming for several, uh, at least a minute. Thousands of rounds of ammunition thrown onto people who were just protesting because of the conditions that they were on. This is a situation that we are under. This capitalism don't tolerate any deviation from what they want. They want slaves, they want idiots, don't think, and this is what they are training up for. There is no news here that tell us this situation. You have to figure it out for yourself. Oh. Thank you, Frank. I'm Michael Foley. Which one are you? This one? I'm Michael Foley. First thing I got to talk about is the Olympics. About a month ago, I stood up there and I said it. I said it on two different weeks. I said I thought it was quite likely that somebody would detonate an atom bomb at the Olympics, <laughs> <laughs> and it didn't happen. You can laugh now, but I said it on two different weeks and nobody laughed when I said it before the Olympics. I'm not surprised really that an atom bomb wasn't detonated, but I am surprised that there wasn't some kind of major horn event at the Olympics. But that's that. The other thing about the end of the world, you don't have to worry about waiting for the end of the world. You don't have to worry about some kind of cataclysmic event, some volcano going off and burying us all alive or something. Maybe it happened. But the trouble, the trouble is we are living through the end of the world right now. Just listen to what Frank just said. He says that a lot. He's right. We're poisoning the air we breathe and we're poisoning the water that we drink. And we've been doing it for a long time. We're burying ourselves in our own garbage. Another thing that's going on and has been going on for a long time, as far as the end of the world, there's an enormous transportation system in this world, and that's why we're all wearing clothes made in foreign countries. It's cheaper to send cotton to foreign countries and have it turned into clothes and have it sent back here on ships than to have people in this country making the clothes here in this country. China has over a billion people, India has over a billion people, you go through Southeast Asia, through Thailand, Cambodia, Vietnam, Laos, and in the island countries, Malaysia, Indonesia, up to Japan, Korea. There's got to be over three billion people living there. There's no telling, it's possible that there are over a billion people living in that part of the world. Their lives would improve if they got a job making 10 bucks a day. Now there's unemployed people in this country, but nobody's going to start opening up factories here in this country and pay people 20 bucks an hour, but they can hire people on the other side of the world paying 10 bucks a day. And that is not going to change. There are billions of people who would be better off financially making 10 bucks a day, and that condition is going to exist for as long as anybody can see. That's why I say we're living through the end of the world. Only thing is, we're not going to be lucky enough to die. We're going to have to live through it and suffer. In case you can't tell, I usually preface my remarks by saying, I'm a doomsday guy. I really am a doomsday guy. Sure. Now, the next good events that are going to approach rapidly, not this coming week, but next week, I think it's late August, August 26, 27, something like that. 
Yeah, August 27th to August 30th is the Republican convention. And then Labor Day week is the Democratic convention. I've been saying for almost a year that I expect in January, next year, January 2013, Rahm Emanuel is going to be inaugurated as President of the United States. Thank you. <laughs> Obama is not going to be reelected, and George Rodney is not going to be elected. Somehow... He can't be. He's dead. I think you met Mitt Romney. Yeah, I'm sorry. Mitt Romney. <laughs> Thank you. That's but anyway, I believe that somehow Rahm Emanuel is going to be inaugurated as President of the United States. How's that going to happen? I have no idea. I really, really have no idea. But it just seems like events are happening. Can he use TIF funds? Another, another TIF event funds? is going to occur, I've said this before, September 15th, September 15th, a month from now, is the 77th anniversary <laughs> of the enactment of the Nuremberg Laws in Germany. And I believe that event is going to be observed in this country, and we're not going to be happy. I don't know much about the Nuremberg Laws, but it's my understanding that these laws were passed in Germany, and they said that Jewish people from Germany had no rights. And I think somewhere around mid-September this year, whatever is going on in this country, we people are going to realize that none of us in this country have any rights. The 77th anniversary of the opening of the Daku concentration camp was observed in this country by the passage of Obama's health law. The 77th anniversary of Adolf Hitler becoming Fuhrer was observed by this year budget act, this cataclysm of budget act. And I don't want to sound, I just want to say what I got to say, I don't want to sound like I'm an anti-Jewish or anti-Semitic tyrant. I'm not. This is people of, from all backgrounds, from all over the world, are attacking the American Empire. It's not Jewish people, it's not some kind of a Jew thing, Hebrew thing, anything like that. People from all over the world, and even in this country, are doing everything they can to end the American Empire. And that's the reason for all this. Thank you. I went to a summer dance. Let y'all know this is the only thing I do. I can dance and I can do other things too. But uh, I had to come at the end of it because this man here, like me, we take advantage of our learning, longevity. In other words, the young ladies over there, the young people over there, I'll forgive them. They ain't old enough. They ain't seen all the lies. They ain't heard all the propaganda. They ain't taking time. Uh, they don't have the time, I'm sorry. They don't have the time to have the other side. All they get is what they were told they supposed to get. Mom and dad wasn't able to protect me. and ain't able to protect young folks. Why? They was brainwashed and conditioned like everybody else. And how can they come to you and say, baby, don't believe that shit. Don't look this way. Keep your eye on that asshole. They can't tell you that. Well, Adam mentioned it. He said that some people, if you showed them in black and white and you put it right here, they wouldn't accept it. Why? He said it was like the Catholic Church Syndrome. I call it the Stockholm Syndrome in the abused housewife syndrome. In other words, oh no, not my husband. Oh no, not my this, not my priest, not my country. Give me a break, please. Every country in the world is worried about the people that they control. Every country in the world, if you read the books, <laughs> Cicero got famous defending conspirator against the Roman Empire, ah, uh, prosecute them. Cicero, Catiline is one I remember as the uh, offender. But they'll tell you, brainwash you, and they use every other country in the world, and every other Can thing, you to tell you how you good again. you got. Mm. And they'll tell you so a whole sorry. bunch of lies. Oh, so like two and two is fine. Literally. And you got people that believe that. 
But when you get our age, you're supposed to be able to say, hey man, I remember what you told me in 1950. I remember what part of, I was here when you went to Vietnam. I was here when the president got shot in Dallas. I know what you told me then, and I know what you tell me now. If you were telling the lie then, you telling the lie now. And if you haven't told the truth then, you still telling the lie now. Now, Adney, we went to this a little seminar, and they had film, the 911 uh, uh, film, and has a building, got fired on, on two stories on one side of the building, and we look at, and the goddamn building fall right down to the ground. A goddamn high ride in, in 20, what, what, 20, what year was that? 20, uh, 2001. Yeah, tw the so called modern, modern age, right? They built high rise scale. Skyscrapers back in 18 something, right here in Chicago. Now, the building falls straight down to the ground because the little fire was up there. Well, there's people like Andy and me, and we can't find nobody else to say, man, ain't no goddamn fire gonna make a steel high rise fall down in the streets back there. So, people, and, and, and Frank was right on, I don't understand it. I kind of mentioned it when he was at the podium here. If somebody done stole our country, and he running it, and been running it for numerous of years, at least since World War, I was probably running before that, but sure enough got a hand since World War II, they running our country. And believe it or not, they got a hold to it. They didn't shoot nobody. They got a hold to it legally. And what I mean about legally, that they is able to go to your senator and your Congress yeah. and get what they want. Legally, the, uh, the power to do what the hell they want to do. Do you think that those people that run the world and running us, our country, gonna let one man, well, oh, he's the president. Well, the president don't run shit. If he did, how can I stand here and say these one good citizens are running it? That's a contradiction. <laughs> if I said, well, the, the president and they are running, give me a break, please. The president ain't got the power to pass no goddamn law, and that goes way back. And he showed up, they got the power to do a whole bunch of shit. And the people that run it, like I said, would be a contradiction. If I said that all we need is X to come in, he'll straight things out. That's what I can't understand from people my goddamn age. I don't blame them young folks. I, I ain't always been awake. When I was young, like St. Paul, I thought as a child, I acted like as a child, I believed like a child, did that silly child of thing. But I ain't no child no more. I'm old enough to see what happened day in and day out and year in and year out. And I saw everything, not everything, I saw all those things that was important for me to protect myself. They are not going to brainwash me. And like uh, 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 Frank said, forget about the school. If you ain't going to learn shit there if you want to be a complete individual. Because they not, don't even teach you that. Oh, they going to shoot that away. They even uh, cut out the classic. They don't want you to be a critical thinker. And that ain't going to, uh, that's what you need to protect yourself and say, I'm mad as hell and I'm not going to take it no more. Uh, I will admit that I came here fearing something entirely different, you know, like the prophecy says this, that the world is going to end on such and such a day. And I tend to be very leery of prophecies. Even though I am a practicing Catholic that is a branch of Christianity which does not tend to take the Bible literally, fortunately. Uh, it really doesn't. And uh, so consequently, I take that with a grain of salt. What I don't take with a grain of salt, however, is the fact that, to paraphrase uh, what you have often said here in the past, we are in a world of shit. Uh, the truth of the matter is that we saw this past summer the highest temperatures on record in recorded history. 
Now, admittedly, that has only been for about 150 years, but the fact of the matter is that ought to be alarming enough. We also have had an unprecedented number of ozone warnings. We have had, any doctor will tell you, uh, in cities like Chicago and New York and elsewhere, an unprecedented number of respiratory diseases. There are some serious problems here, and yes, uh, we can say, well, why doesn't the government do something about it? Why doesn't Congress do something about it? The fact of the matter is, and that was the reason for some of my questions earlier, you do not get elected president and you do not get elected to Congress uh, without money from some of the very organizations and businesses which are responsible for some of these problems. You need the support of the National Rifle Association, you need the support of big oil, you need the support of other industries uh, which have contributed to uh, uh, these kinds of problems. Now, I know it sounds charmingly romantic to say, well, a candidate with a right idea can uh, do like a Mr. Smith goes to Washington and inflame the imagination of the American people and end up a congressman or a U.S. senator. We live in a real world where it costs close to a million dollars, if not more, to get elected to Congress in the average urban district. <coughs> Money is what makes it possible because you need to hire staff, you need to hire uh, people to do your advertising for you, you need to have a good PR team, you need to have an organization that is put together that can reach out uh, to other political entities. You enter a political campaign like you would enter a war with a battle plan and a playbook. Without that, you are in most cases lost. I don't care what your party label is. Now, I learned this early. My father was a professional campaign organizer. I used to sit uh, in the office there and watch how some of this was done. The mailings, the press releases, that kind of stuff. And I realized early on that Mr. Smith Goes to Washington was a very, very charming you know, fantasy, <coughs> but it's not real, it wasn't real in the 1950s, and it's not real today. If you want to get elected, you have to have this kind of money in order to do it. And I don't know about anyone else, but I don't enter any kind of a contest without trying my damnedest to win. I don't want to make a point. If I want to make a point, there are any number of bars in Chicago where uh, people will be drunk enough to listen to me for a half hour, 45 minutes. I don't want to make a point. If I were to run, I want to run to win. And to do that, you need the wherewithal to do it. So that was why I asked, are you interested in a scientific re revolution or a political revolution? Because when enough scientists, credible scientists, start making the case that we better do something or we're going to be in deep, deep doo-doo, uh, sooner or later, even a government not disposed to turn up their nose at big oil and big energy, they're going to have to do something because they'll realize that the survival of their very constituents are at stake. To the media. Uh, you blame a lot of things on the mainstream media. The fact of the matter is, much of what was said tonight was in the mainstream media. It was in the Chicago Tribune, it was in the Chicago Sun-Times, it was in the New York Times, and it was certainly in papers overseas because I do look at those occasionally when I can. I can also tell you that in other countries that I have been in, most notably Ireland, there is a growing awareness of the need to protect our environment before the environment obliterates us. Uh, pun intended, Ireland is one of the greenest countries in the world. Uh, they're very, very uh, concerned about that kind of thing. And their government has made it rather clear that yes, while big energy is welcome, it is not welcome at the expense of obliterating the country. 
and uh, the United States has to take has to take a similar stance. This is only going to come when the science is solid and when the American people are, as they say, mad enough and not going to take it any longer. But please, let's not talk about some green candidate with a budget of $500 changing the world. That's not going to happen. What's going to happen is when more and more doctors start complaining about the number of childhood asthma cases they're getting in New York and Chicago. And, you know, I think anyone connected with the medical profession will agree that this is a growing problem. Uh, 25 years ago, tobacco was a major killer. Now we've got the, now we've got the uh, air we breathe is a major killer. We, okay, before they kill me, i got to get down. Carlos. <laughs> yes, uh, hi. Um, okay, well, uh, Andy made, made his presentation based on a, a variety of materials that I guess he has covered in the last year or so. I don't know how long he's been studying this. Uh, I was fortunate to, uh, to meet uh, members of the Hopi uh, traveling delegation that were on their way to the United Nations back in the early 70s, and uh, since that time I have always uh, paid attention to what I could learn about uh, these people that we know as the Hopis. The Hopis, of course, look, if I, some of you may know, the word Hopi actually means peaceful. Uh, they are one of the uh, oldest and uh, continuously uh, active group of people living in the Four Corners area of, of our United States. Um, the Oribe village uh, was where uh, this gentleman, Tomas Banyanyaka, who was an Hopi elder, who was traveling with uh, a gentleman by the name of Father David, and uh, they said some things about the prophecy. They had a, um, there is in fact a, a glyph or a chart that they, that they uh, were showing. Uh, they said the Hopis that uh, this is part of the prophecy here, that they knew of a time was coming when voices would be carried across our land on the threads of a spider web. That there would be poles with spider webs hanging from one end to the other at some point. They saw that world coming. Uh, they saw a time when people would travel in boxes across the land, back and forth. They saw a time when some of these people would also be able to travel off the earth and travel and remain, these travelers would remain so long off the earth that they would be considered like orphans and that eventually some of these orphans would fall from the sky and fall to earth. And these, uh, these signs uh, were part of the, uh, the changing of the world that we would be in. They also saw uh, the symbol of the swastika uh, rising to become a world force that would shape the world and, uh, and it would conclude with the dropping of gourds that would turn cities into ashes. This is some of the props. Um, they said that there would be uh, many people living uh, at, towards the end of the world that have a vast disconnect between what is real and of course what is artificial and ultimately um, it would lead to our destruction of our food stock and the, so and the source and the result would be that there'd be very few food options left. And for the Hopis, that meant corn and man's fate are uh, intimately linked. And that would be a very key issue about uh, grain and food at the close of this world. And they said there'd be many choices given to us, but most people will not be in tune to them because their heads are disconnected from their bodies. And they live up in their heads, and they don't use their bodies hardly, except to um, go and walk on the path. They said we lived in a world of the zigzag path, and the man, uh, Banyaka, he said, which reminded him as he saw him pointing out the zigzag, he said, maybe this is our stock market. <laughs> went up and down, up and down. And he said towards the end, there'd only be a small number of people who would ever uh, be able to remain human before the close of this world. And so where did they get this information, someone might say? thing is, this is information that was given to them, oral tradition, it wasn't written down, they didn't have the Gutenberg, they didn't have the type, they didn't print it out, they didn't have pen and quill, but it was told orally, they had a vision, and they continued to, they wrote it on the wall, and they just told the story behind that. So, uh, 
I'm sure you can find um, a lot more information about it, but again, just as you were talking about the Mayans, this is also another indigenous culture that somehow predicted things that lo and behold have come true. Now you can say, gee, how did they do it? Again, I'm not entirely certain, but we have remote viewing. Thank you. Even in our Christian Bible, they have prophetic utterances. Oh. The verse that comes to mind is from the book of Daniel, where it says, Daniel, seal these prophecies up until the time of the end, when men shall run to and fro, and knowledge shall increase. I bring this up because every culture and every place has actually had some kind of predictive ability. But you know, when you're really trying to predict the future, there is a science to it. And that science is called demographics. And believe it or not, I believe that the demographics and other trends are going to bring us some actual real hope in the future. The first and foremost thing you're going to have to see over the next hundred years is we are reducing our population. And I'll tell you why, it's a very simple thing. As a country is developing, children are looked at as a source of labor. They are easy to, to make and they can go out on a farm and uh, provide you with a sense of security in old age. But when you get into a developed country, children are a pain in the ass. One or two of them and it costs you about half a million dollars to raise. You may have one or two for the emotional benefits, but you're not going to certainly have ten. And as you look around the world at developing countries, we're starting to see a crisis in aging. That should be good news because that means we're going to be consuming less. The second thing you're going to have to realize is that the United States is just basically at the cusp of its power. There is not a power in the world that has access to the Atlantic or the Pacific Ocean or space that the United States does not have. It. You cannot move a ship on the sea without the implicit consent of the United States Navy. And when you have an empire that has a security apparatus like that, they're not going to go down for quite a while. So what has been our biggest export around the world? My contention is that it's been security. And it's been keeping the, keeping the, the trade lanes open and keeping a certain dominance to keep other nations from doing this. However, I do believe the United States is still an adolescent in keeping its power. Like any boy who has to prove himself to his peers that he's all powerful, we did with the Iran-Iraq war and the uh, little adventures into Afghanistan. We're just trying to flex our muscles to prove to the world. And of course, you know, we're also learning to drive. We have this great thing called the information superhighway, and we still haven't learned to navigate it properly. It's connected the world, and there's maybe a few rules, but we still are in our infancy on trying to do that. The third thing that I'm going to predict here is that I do believe that there will be a solution to global warming and climate change. And that, my friends, was done, I think, in a very realistic argument by a gentleman by the name of John Kuntz, who was here earlier, and he talked about thorium nuclear power. Now, there is going to be renewables. There is a place for solar, but I don't think we're going to have the completely reliable baseload power that's going to need to be done. Now, I'm not going to get into a lot of technical explanations about it here. The more I've looked into this solution, the more I see it's going to be on its way. And yes, I do believe that economically we will be in a good century coming ahead. I see that the process of development is happening around the world still. We're seeing India and China with rising economies. The next one's going to be Africa. The only thing that's holding us back is that we just, there isn't, it isn't that the world 
doesn't have capitalism, it's because it doesn't have enough capitalism. There is not enough systematic uh, protections given for property rights, for enforcement of contract, for enforcement of other things that means that allows people to transact business and exchange money freely. The rich can do it, but not the poor of a lot of countries. If you look at a book called The Mystery of Capital by Hernando de Soto, he gets into these arguments. And his book has been one of the second most best-selling next to the scriptures in the countries around the Latin America. Thank you. Okay, Andy, thank you for a uh, nice stimulating discussion tonight. Um, I'm glad you uh, brought up fracking because I think it was last night, last week, we had the, uh, the gentleman from the film festival here. We were talking about films, and I, I couldn't remember the name of the film I saw about fracking, but I remember it now. It's called Gasland. Gasland. Man, was that a good film. Your gas and, uh, Really, uh, I was totally unaware of fracking and, and all that until I saw that film. And uh, I'm definitely 100% against fracking, and it's just really an eye-opening documentary. So really check that out. It, it, everything Andy said is true. I mean, this, you know, no, it's called Gasland. That's yes. the name of the documentary. Yeah, it's about fracking. And uh, let the market decide. There's numerous, uh, <laughs> numerous uh, uh, scenes the in there where uh, you know they're lighting water on fire, and you're seeing water bubble, and uh, you know, just all kinds of amazing That's things. Like so. so, so check that out for sure. Uh, also, let's see. I, I spent a little bit of this afternoon instead of reading about the Mayan calendar and all that, I got sidetracked. Reading about reading the Russian Constitution because of uh, of this pussy riot case, and uh, as you might know, this this punk rock group uh, Pussy Riot was uh, sentenced to to two years in jail uh, for hooliganism because they stormed into a church in Moscow and got up on the altar and were singing their lyrics, their anti-Putin lyrics. They're sort of anti-Putin. They're more anti-Putin than anti-religion. They're criticizing uh, the Russian Orthodox Church, the Russian Orthodox uh, Church's, uh, uh, you know, kind of uh, new, uh, yeah, what do they call it? Patriarchy. Patriarchy. Uh, you know, they, these, you know, the Russian, the, the Russian Orthodox Church, Russian Orthodox Church used to be a, a, sort of an enemy of the government uh, during the battle days of the Soviet Union. Now they're back to allies again. They have this symbiotic relationship like uh, uh, like Mussolini did with the Catholic Church in Italy. So anyway, they're protesting against that. Well, anyway, the Russian, Revol the Russian uh, Constitution, uh, Article 29.1, says that everyone shall have the right to free thought and free speech. But then 29.2 says speech that is, uh, uh, you know, uh, that, that depicts uh, hatred uh, towards uh, ethni ethnicities or religions or a few other things, you know, is impermissible. Um, so, you know, so they have free speech, but it's but it's but it's limited. Uh, and uh, I don't know. I'm, now they're they're sort of they have a, some good things in their constitution. Like one thing they have in their constitution that we don't have here is that uh, people are not, they cannot be coerced uh, or forced into joining a union or any other, any other, uh, any other organization or, you know, membership. Now that something we only have here based on the state you live in. I live in Indiana, which is a free state that doesn't, doesn't have that coercion, that coercion force uh, over us, but you in Illinois, Unfortunately, live in a, a union state, and that's where you're forced to join a union against your will. Um, so, okay, I want to bring up this thing about the South African miners. You know, these South African miners were, there was a huge group of them. They just killed a couple police officers a day or two before, and they were attacking these police with, they had machetes and, and clubs and spears, and, uh, and they were attacking these police, and I'll tell you, you know, I don't think it's a very smart thing 
to attack armed police with weapons and you know knives and spears and machetes. I mean, you know, if you want to you want to protest about something, you can't do it that way. So I, you know, to me, it's like no big surprise that somebody who attacks an armed cop with a machete gets shot. Um, a few other things here. Oh, CEOs stealing money. I constantly something I constantly hear here about CEOs stealing money. I don't think any CEOs are stealing anything. I think they're they're getting they're getting money that is you know people are voluntar voluntarily buying their products. I'm trying to think of an instance. I was trying to think of that today. An instance of where a CEO has stolen money from me. Now, I don't own any Apple products. Well, I do. Well, actually, I do have an old Apple Mac that I bought years ago. But uh, uh, that was a voluntary exchange. I mean, I bought. I bought that computer because I was going to teach a class at a school off-site from where I used to teach that used those computers. I needed to learn that computer, so I bought one to, to learn so I could teach the students. And uh, I have a few IBM computers that I bought, a couple laptops and a desktop that have served me well. And, uh, you know, do I consider that the IBM uh, executive stole that, my, that money from me? No, I got excellent lab like this, like these excellent little laptops. Uh, Made by this is Lenovo, but it's a former, former IBM company. Uh, you know, this was a voluntary thing. I I, I love this little thing, and uh, I don't consider it theft at all. That uh, that I that I bought it. It gave me exactly what I wanted, uh, and it was very reasonable. Well, actually, I bought this one used, but it was still under three hundred bucks. Um, so anyway, I don't know. I can't think of any any case where a CEO s stole something. All, all they're guilty of is piloting their companies uh, and uh, making them successful. And some other time when we have more time, I can give you a little more detailed reason of why pay has gotten higher for CEOs. And one last thing, yes. yeah, like I found the Federal that. Employee Pay Database online. You can go over to Google and search it. Just search for Federal Employee Pay. It's, a, it's a, a, a run by a Gannett company called, uh, I think it's called Data Universe. But uh, all you have to do is go over there and uh, you can type in any federal employee's name and select a location from a drop down list, like what state they live in or something. And it'll give you everything all about them their pay grade and what they earn and their bonus and the whole bit. Hey, Chuck. You are in the open now. Betterment, Better Government Association has had it for about 10 years. And they're working on, the, they're working on the one with benefits. That's coming up. That's the real thing. Real They're stealing for you. You want to see stealing? That's stealing. I see ignorance is alive and well in the state. <laughs> <laughs> Apparently, these people still want to live in like Benjamin Harrison or Grover Cleveland as president of the United States. What's wrong with that? <laughs> well, what's wrong with that? You ask. Yeah, you spoke of good. property rights earlier. <laughs> well. I think in South Africa, we just had a, a great demonstration of property rights in which these miners died in a, in a, in because people were defending their property rights. <laughs> Apparently in South Africa, the definition of property rights involves killing your fellow man. I would say simply that, you're, that the views of those folks in Indiana would do credit to Henry Clay Frick. <laughs> and, and his actions toward the Carnegie steel workers during the Homestead steel strike. Apparently not much changes on a day-to-day -day basis in Indiana, which is why they are governed by that Nazi right to work statute. <laughs> the only real issue that I had with Tim here was when he spoke of the Christian Bible. I would call it the Judeo-Christian Bible. Oh, yeah. <laughs> That's right. True. Particularly since the book of Daniel is in what you would call the Old Testament. Yep. All right. It would be nice if the folks in Indiana would adopt a more enlightened attitude, including the wearing of enlightened, more enlightened t-shirts. <laughs> <laughs> a new Chick-fil-A just opened up at Crystal Lake. I was there this afternoon and I had a good sandwich. I'm sure it does, but all the same. Is that the only t-shirt that they wear in Indiana these days? Don't you guys have any other ones? <laughs> A 
finally, I would say also to Patrick, most of whose comments I agree with, and I think that the, which when you spoke of solid science, I think the science is already pretty solid on the subject of global warming. Oh, I agree. I agree. Okay. I don't think we need to wait for any more scientific evidence to come in here. We don't need to, but some of the powers that be probably need it. All right. I concur in that. Yes, I think the politicians in Washington and Springfield and elsewhere need a nice big wake-up call. Yes. Why that hasn't come yet, I do not know. They need to wait until, uh, and that's, that's something I do agree with Andy about, do they need to wait until Washington, New York, and other coastal cities are flooded before they finally try to do something about global warming? I think it's going to be a little late by then, don't you? They can move to Indiana. Yeah. Yeah, why not? <laughs> the Great <laughs> Plains of Illinois. Why not? Thank and great you. economic development for the area. <laughs> okay. Uh, well, we do have today, part on the topic and part not. Um, I, I, this was sort of uh, false advertising. I thought I was going to get something actually about Mayans, but we really didn't. Uh, we do know how the Mayans made their calendar. They were, uh, th that's very clear in the record. They were solar astronomers. They were very accurate. They had a more accurate calendar than contemporary calendars in Europe at the time. Um, I was in Cuernavaca, which is uh, about 30, 40 miles uh, northwest of uh, Mexico City. It's in the Morelos Valley, which is a valley that connects northern and southern Mexico, um, and was in fact a sort of a, a trade route between Mexico and uh, Central America. In the middle of the valley, there's this hill outside of Cuernavaca, and um, actually way outside of Cuernavaca because Cuernavaca is in the mountains. And um, it, it, this hill is just right in the middle of the valley and you go in a cave that's under the hill. And what happens in this cave is you get into the middle of the mountain and actually it's, it's kind of a mountain and they dug an octagonal shaped tunnel from the, the cave up to the top of the mountain straight down, it's so that the light goes straight down to the bottom of the cave. And on the, and in the equinox, in the spring and the fall, the sun is directly above that hole there, so the light goes directly to the floor of the cave. And they made the walls of that hole into an octagon, and they painted things on the floor of the cave that they, they are not sure how to interpret, except that when they look at that and saw how the sun traveled, how the light traveled over the floor of that cave as the sun moved across the, the sky over the seasons, they were able to make a calendar based on those observations. That is not the only solar observatory in Mexico and in uh, Central America. The second thing was around there were pyramids and there were this bas relief carvings on the walls. Of, I'm so cold in here, it's terrible. Yeah. Anyway, <laughs> um, there were bas relief carvings around the, around the temples and the interpretation of it was that at that era that the astronomers were finally pulling together all of their observations, so they were coordinating all of the calendars throughout the Mayan Empire so that they were all going to agree on what day it was. And so that they had not only that process of making those accurate observations, but also the scientific awareness that they really had to use science instead of the mythology to make a coherent calendar which is not what they did in Europe, because it wasn't until the 1700s or something that they finally decided that the Pope had to make some kind of a, a, a pronouncement to correct the calendar, because January the 1st was coming in what is now April or something, because of the way the calendar was shifting incorrectly throughout the year. 
So um, that's one thing. And, and then the thing about predictions. Um, I read a Wikipedia article, and I have to say that Wikipedia, um, according to what I read and I agree with, it should be the start of your investigations, not the end of your investigations. However, um, one of the uh, academic um, people who had done an enormous amount of actual research into Mayan times and into uh, Central America and Mexico, into the culture and history of the area, said that there was no prediction in the Mayan calendar. There, uh, and there, uh, that, the, that, that actually, basically, what, what would happen is there are a lot of people who are saying that the Mayan calendar is predicting the end of the world. And those people are doing it for their own reasons and for, you know, enriching themselves. I would like to point out that um, Andy received a meal doing this presentation tonight, so he also benefited from that. Um, <laughs> a very small joke. Um, at any rate, um, so that um, that the predictions are really something that we that we all make and that all cultures have made and all, um, in all epochs. And it's because the, of the way the human mind works. We want to make patterns out of things. We want to look at an ink blot, say it's a butterfly or a baby or, or an ant hazel that you really don't like or whatever it is that's going on in your life at the time. Um, so that we, we are pattern makers, and so as pattern makers, we predict, we try to predict what's going to happen, and that's just part of our human nature. So it really doesn't have a damn thing to do with calendar or anything else. And then uh, the, the last area of comment that I would like to make is that, is that Andy never fails to really um, make me angry and, and make me upset and um, Oh, well, I, I, I get upset when I listen to him. Oh, darn. Anyway, because it's such a mishmash of things that are really true and really right on, and things that are just absolutely total bullshit. Uh, censorship is necessary because there's always a danger of something being said. That's what Pat Polson said in 1968. And I'm afraid that's true even here at the College of Complexes. And it even includes maybe some self-censorship. You know, the inability to deal with certain conclusions that recognizing certain facts would <coughs> impose. Uh, that's a big topic, but uh, I think there are some, it can be broken down a little bit. I think there's a lot of self-censorship about opposing views to the union around here. We had a little bit tonight. And there's, what I've just come to realize recently, if we're going to build steam locomotives again, we have to reconstruct an industry that's been out of business for about 60 years. Well, there were steam locomotives that were built up until about the early 50s. But it's not just a matter of reconstructing coaling towers and watering facilities and maintenance facilities. But it's also a matter of constructing an accessory business and things like stokers and uh, feed water heaters and so on. Well, you don't have to be any steam locomotive to say something like this. I was just looking at a book recently by a very ardent advocate of steam locomotives and he thought the steam locomotive industry was gone. In a 1963 book. Don't you think burning coal was uh, one fool at a time and global warming? Well, one one fool at a time. Well, that's where that's where this. Uh, you want the deal? The, 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 maybe that's where this thorium comes in. 
I still uh, am exploring or ideas on producing that on smaller than power plant scales. And uh, I might, you know, uh, there's a thing in Trains Magazine in uh, the July issue about rebuilding a steam locomotive. And uh, the guy's talking about something called biocolo, just exactly what that is, I don't know. I'd like to see some more about it. But if it's the biocolo, it's not going to increase. It's going to take as much carbon out of the atmosphere as it puts back in. It won't take put carbon into the atmosphere that it hasn't first taken out. And I think there's also a certain amount of censorship Talk about technologies that are censored. How did he figure that? There's a uh, monorail technology that uses an overhead beam. And an moving your induction motor is right underneath the beam to both suspend and control the vehicle. And what would you, what do you even hear about that? Do you even hear about that from, from, from some of our local transit advocates? <laughs> one train, nine power, power. power. <laughs> but anyway. Steve Wright. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. You are out of your league, man. Well, anyway. Well, maybe that's still censorship, too. Yeah, sure. You should. Yeah. Well, you got to explore things. You can't just say, oh, that's out of your league. That's not but explore. it is, man. It that's is. Not, that's not, that's not sense. Well, that, that's that's a fiat. That you're taking you're taking that on. You you just take that on faith. One time, Frank. <laughs> you're just taking that on faith. You're not. That's not the scientific method. You got to explore hypotheses. And if you're you're not going to explore hypotheses, then you're not being scientific. You are not. Being well, I'm exploring hypotheses, and you're not. That's the difference between you and me. <laughs> And you're interrupting as much as he does. It's hypothetical. You know, one fool at a time. How efficient is a steam engine? Well, uh, it can be a little more efficient than what you might think. It's not at all, about 15%. Well, that's, that's the old time steam engine is. Oh, well, you got to do one. But anyway, uh, you got to consider the whole thing. Things in like the whole. Okay. I've just come to realize this just again recently. We have to consider everything that could, might possibly bear on a situation. Because there might be all this global warming and everything else that we're going to get. And if you're just going to take things out at, at, at face value, well, <coughs> which maybe you want to do, but you can do that to your, you know, self-censorship destruction. All right. Uh, there, the, the Georgists, uh, the Henry Georgists, are, are going to take up a discussion discussion uh, of the little book, The Communist Manifesto, a, a manifesto <laughs> issued in 1848 uh, for a uh, group uh, mostly of uh, German workers uh, who uh, in that revolutionary period uh, were looking for a program, a prospectus uh, for some kind of liberation and progress. Uh, Karl Marx and Frederick Engels uh, wrote for that association, uh, and 22 years later, uh, Marx said uh, that it was dated, <laughs> and he uh, said it needed a lot of correction, but 
basically, uh, he, he believed in, in public education and uh, things like uh, uh, income taxes, uh, the wealth taxes, and so on. Uh, revolutionary at that time, but not terribly revolutionary Pardon? as we think of uh, the things. Wait a second. Um, Nevertheless, I'll just you on the he analyzed. Yeah, I need 82, 82, yeah, 82, 82, 82, 82, 82 tendencies and friends uh, of, get really uh, can I just of, give you the chain of the, of the capitalist market and uh, capitalist, uh, the market relationships, the social relationships of the means of production. And he saw that uh, capitalism impoverished a lot of people. <laughs> it wasn't, that was not something that uh, other economists, including even uh, Adam Smith, had not seen, but he saw it as a revolutionary tendency that would replace the capitalist class that had replaced the feudal class. The land-owning class would be replaced by a, a capital-owning class, and the capital-owning class would be replaced he hoped by the working class or organizing itself to liberate itself worldwide. He forecast the uh, global market. Uh, he forecast lots of things that people didn't think possible. And uh, his predictions were true, uh, and uh, he, he placed his, uh, his hope for the future uh, on a, a scientific basis with the factor of a struggle for human freedom. I think people are always looking to liberate themselves from various oppressions. And he felt that human beings would liberate themselves. Uh, it wasn't a, a, a deterministic philosophy. He saw tendencies and possibilities and uh, and probabilities in the development of history. I've got one second left, and that's about it. Yeah, all right, Bob. Thank you very much. I'll be quick. All right, thank you, Andy, for another intriguing evening. I'll be eclectic as usual. First of all, this is amazing. We're in a lecture on global warming, so Bill gets up here, and there's probably no device or machine or creation of mankind that makes a greater contribution to global warming than the steam engine. Think of it this way, you're shoveling enormous quantities of fossil fuels into a <coughs> boiler and the choo-choo part is doing nothing but producing global warming. And it's spreading it all over and it moves around and does this. Now you want to have 50,000 of these, like we used to have in the United States, doing this every day. Um, I can guarantee you, if you wanted, we wouldn't have to wait for 2012 for global warming. That's for sure. But my major concern here, um, I'd look a little bit more on religion and prophecy, because that's what we're talking about. This is uh, the priestly class came up uh, with prophecy. And anytime I think of religion and prophecy, I 
I think of the medicine men of the Indian tribe who said, well, I can tell you how to get the buffalo to come here to, we need if the buffalo so we can hunt the buffalo. And he told the guys, he said, you do this dance. And they did the dance. And if the buffalo come, he says, see, boy, he's, he's got the gift of prophecy. And if the buffalo don't show up, the medicine man says, well, you didn't dance right. You didn't do it properly. Do it again. And we'll see what happens. Uh, yes, the, 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 who's, the, who's the great prophesizer of the Western? It has to be John the Revelator. Uh, John Tutmos, the Book of Revelations. Uh, he got his, you didn't tell us where the Admirians got their prophecies. He got his... He lived in a cave in Tutmos, and there was a crack in the ceiling, and voices came out and told him how the world was going to end. There's a whole classification of religions called the Adventists, uh, among them Jehovah Witnesses, the Mormons, of course the Seventh-day Adventists, and I'd recommend staying away from all of them altogether. <laughs> They, they make absolutely the, this convoluted kind of concurrence and see what all the fact, all the fact evidence proves that our prophecies are in fact correct. Looking at ancient civilizations, I really don't know about much about the Mayans, Muslim Americans. The only thing I know is their entire body of literature was destroyed by the, the, the Spanish priests who burned them all. The only thing, I've got to, I've got to have some fun with you. I've seen a lot of these um, astrological <laughs> structures, which amazes there are, there are there are thousands of these, which yeah. I've got to really stop a minute and from Stonehenge on this date and that kind of stuff, and you see this in Indiana Jones. And <laughs> the amazing thing is, I was in Grand Central Station. And there is one in Grand Central Station in New York City. There's a photograph taken with the light going through the windows. And the railroad photographer, like myself, claimed that this photo could be taken on only one day of the year. But the lighting conditions would replicate themselves to allow you to take this photograph here. Um, anyhow, uh, the ancient people, I... I I don't know, they have legends and so forth, whether or not it has any relevance, maybe some insights into our current situation. It's not causality or any basis for, for thing. Look to the ancients in this regard, but they had no particular skills or anything of that nature in terms of the Also their calendar. I've always I spoke on the calendar many a couple of years ago and my thing was nothing came close to the Egyptians. And they didn't muck around with the calendar and things like that, and the Romans and everybody. But the Egyptians had it figured out, and that's exactly the calendar that you and I use every day of the year. Thank you very much. The last word from Andy Anderson. Yes. Okay, I'll try to answer some of your concerns. Um, I have to agree with Gene. He had a classic point. Um, some people have what we call you know, battered wife syndrome, we call it, or Stockholm syndrome. Uh, you know, wife abuse and child abuse is a big problem because sometimes the closest family members won't face the reality that's right in front of their face. They just, for them, it doesn't exist. Uh, we see uh, young girls that are completely normal can look in the mirror and see some fat person. It's called anorexia. It's a kind of a, a mental illness that's treatable, but there's all kinds of perception problems that are treatable. I think it was Sinclair Lewis uh, that was quoted back in 1935 or something that said, it's very difficult to get a person to understand something or understand the fact if their job depends on their not understanding it.
Uh, the, the, I think it's the ancient uh, Chinese, uh, ancient Chinese proverb that says, you cannot wake up a person who is pretending to be asleep. Does that uh, ring any bells? Uh, well, what we have, uh, I have a special sympathy for people that have been involved in any, uh, any level of the medical community in America in the last 30 years. Because if you were in the medical community, you treated people that had AIDS, or you know somebody <coughs> who had AIDS, or you know somebody who had a son or a daughter who had died of AIDS. <clears throat> and for the parents, it's very hard for the parents of someone who has died of AIDS to begin to look at the emerging evidence that shows that their son or daughter didn't die of AIDS, that they were poisoned and killed by the pharmaceutical industry. And um, it's easy to say that's bullshit yeah, if you haven't read anything about it. But uh, Frank, I, I, dare, I, I challenge you to read any yeah, of the yeah, books yeah. published by the scientists talking about Don't this. This is the problem we have where people stand up at the podium and say that's bullshit, bullshit. and they have no idea what they're talking about. So, um, you know, it's easy to attack the messenger, Frank, but I understand you can't face the reality of it. Uh, my personal view is that enough people have already died from medical malpractice in this country. And that uh, is not just AIDS, it's a bunch of other things where, you know, you've heard Doc Mike talk about this. A couple hundred thousand people a year, three, four hundred thousand a year are, are killed with... Uh, various kinds of things in hospitals, uh, all kinds of medical malpractice, where we, if we had, if we did not have a for-profit system, if it was like in other countries where the goal is to keep people healthy without making a profit off of sick people, the outcomes would be vastly better. Um, this new book, incidentally, The Betrayal of the American Dream, by uh, Donald Bartlett and James Steele. Uh, they talk about conditions from free enterprise operations around the world. Uh, Apple factories that are making iPods in foreign countries. Uh, one factory, I believe it was somewhere in China, uh, the factory owners finally decided that to solve the problem of their employees committing suicide, leaping out of the dormitory windows, they would put nets around the building and the windows to, uh, to prevent people from committing suicide. Uh, are you familiar with that, Margaret? Yeah. Have you heard yeah, about absolutely. that? Absolutely. Yeah. See, we're, we're on the same page here. I'm, I'm using the same kind of sources. We're in total agreement Why because... Why you use Doc Mike as a source? No, no, I don't use Doc Mike you as a source. Did. You I'm, just did. I'm talking about uh, different kinds of medical malpractice that's been reported with other cases, too. Yeah, Doc well, Mike just summarized it every now. I don't care what he says. Oh, yeah. He's, he's <laughs> but, a sham and a, and a, and a oh, fake. He's a fraud. At any rate... Um, he's a quack. He's a quack quack. <laughs> <laughs> They're talking about, we, we have a choice, all of us, we have a choice. We can continue to tell people that they're full of shit and nothing can be done, or we can face the reality that exists and is provable on a, with a variety of sources on many, many different subjects. And, you know, the only difference, uh, you know, when you disagree with somebody on a subject, if one person has examined the reality and the other one hasn't yet, then you get this disagreement where a person says, well, that can't be true. That's a bunch of bullshit. There, uh, there's no way to you know, uh, prove that. Well, I work with books that summarize huge databases of evidence. And as I told you before, for the last 25 years, my brother and I have been publishing book reports like this. So usually it's one page summary. None of the reports we've published in the last 25 years has gone anywhere but in the total direction of complete acceptance by the scientific That's community in general true. and the general public. Absolutely not true. Not Charlie, true. you want to stand up? Give me a goddamn source or shut the fuck up. I'm tired of it. I'm <laughs> sick and tired of it. It's not more true. You begin to piss me off, Charlie. You're beginning to piss me off. 
and if you think I've given, I've stood up here and said something that wasn't true, what's your source? What do you take? You don't just say it's I'm full of bullshit. I'm not going to tolerate that. Your HIV stuff is bullshit. You're not you you bullshit. haven't looked at it, have you? Charlie, let the man. You don't see. know. Okay. Let him finish. Charlie. This new documentary with world class scientists, the work of hundreds of thousands of man years worth of research all over the world. It's a summary of what's been published, what's what's happening now, the state of the art knowledge. This just came out like a month ago. It's called Positively False: The Birth of a Heresy, and it describes the entire AIDS phenomenon from start to where we are today. And it's not my opinion, Charlie. I'm trying to give you a summary. What about what the United said? Nations and the death of death toll in Africa of millions? They the didn't have of, any drugs. Uh, they, they're, 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 we, we should talk about that someday because they're still promoting the myth that AIDS is killing a lot of people in Africa. They got a lot of sick people. People are dying because they're being misdiagnosed. They're being told they have AIDS from some virus when uh, it's caused by other things. That's the central thesis of this whole thing. A lot of people have died of AIDS. Nobody disputes that. What they're saying is all the illnesses they had were not something new caused by a new virus. The, it, you know, the AIDS epidemic is not what we were told. And a lot of lives have already been saved in Europe and other countries. And a lot of lives are being saved in Africa now because they're stopping giving them the fatal AIDS medicines and they're being treated with better nutrition, clean water. All kinds of sick people in Africa can be cured. Uh, and they go back to testing HIV negative, incidentally, after they've been getting clean water and, and food and nutrition and everything and their health comes back. It's. Um, it's hard to believe that the United States would have promoted something like this for 25 years. The UN too. The, the UN too. This documentary tells about us uh, 10 years in Japan. Uh, they had a, a disease that was killing people. It took them 10 years to face the reality that it was a fatal a drug that was for, uh, they were given for treating the illness. So you know, before you condemn anything I present. Why don't you read the sources? I, I challenge any of you to read the sources and find out if you think it's wrong. But don't 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 go with pre-existing notions and say, well, there's ten books on that, but they're all full of shit. You got two books. Two here tonight. Apparently the speaker gets the last word. The speaker gets the last word. I probably got 15, 15, 15 to 20 week. books on this. Two good books. Night, good night. Good night. Good Have a good, good. one. All right. Good Let's good. thank him again for speaking tonight. She raised money for the 42 million people died.